Okay, it's uh, eight oh one Austin time. Uh, welcome everyone to the second masterclass that is part of the UT Austin quarter year annual conference. For us uh, U.S. participants here, it is a pity that we cannot be in the beautiful city of Lisbon. But um, yeah, thanks to the organizers who did a fabulous job, we are able to offer this class online in a virtual fashion. Um, and let me see, just interrupt, I hope that the session is now being recorded by the host. Uh, and yes, it is, so perfect. I can just wanna make sure that everything is captured now. So today's topic is on platforms for global monitoring and emerging capabilities and challenges. It is part of UT Austin Portugal's program on Earth and space interactions. And this is a good moment for me to be introducing the program area directors of this, uh, of this uh, um, Earth and space interactions, uh, which is Lisa Bastos. She's a professor of geosciences at the University of Porto and also Dr. Pedro Camaño, a professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Porto. So today we have a wonderful lineup of world leading experts and speakers, which I will introduce a little bit later. Before doing that, I will just a quick housekeeping. So for all of our attendees, you have the chance to ask questions and the method to do so is through the Q&A. Uh, so I, I really welcome you and encourage you to, um, to ask questions. Uh, and um, let me see. I, otherwise, we will, most of the presentation, Moriba will have to go a quick a bit faster because he has to leave us, unfortunately, at 10 to 9. Uh, so uh, his presentation will be a bit shorter, but we we'll still uh, should have hopefully 10 minutes of Q&A uh, following his uh, presentation. And uh, of course, everyone should be on mute um, when, uh, while the speakers are talking. And I think that's all for the housekeeping. Um, I'd like to yeah, get, get, really get to the topic of today's masterclass. And I think it, the topic couldn't be more timely. We're facing a range of global crises uh, 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 that affect our planet. Uh, we just here, we're waiting for another hurricane that um, arrives at our shores on the Gulf Coast, uh, probably due tomorrow. We've witnessed a catastrophic season of wildfires in various parts of the world, especially here, we've seen it here in, in California. And our satellites are observing changes of the polar ice sheets that create concern for global sea level rise and coastal flooding. So Earth observations, in particular satellites um, for global monitoring play an essential role for understanding, for improving predictive capabilities of our forecast models and for assessing risk associated with the natural hazards. Through its shared expertises and collaboration, uh, the UT Austin Portugal program has emerged as an important player in developing an integrative approach to space technologies, um, to uh, sea, climate, and clean uh, energy uh, sciences and, um, and engineering. The research agenda that the, uh, the Earth and Space um, uh, um, um, program of the UT uh, Austin Portugal program provides is implemented through transatlantic north south cooperation uh, in a complex engineering systems and in science. Our program area will focus on the exploitation, um, exploiting the potential of an integrating space borne, air borne, marine borne, along with underwater data towards better understanding of the ocean, uh, the deep sea of it. Um, and all the interaction between the atmosphere and the, the large um, other parts of the Earth system components to improve predictive capabilities of, and, and for, uh, for forecasting and weather forecasting all the way to climate timescales. So, and as an exciting development, the research will be developed together with the installation of the um, AIR Center, the Atlantic Interactions uh, Research Center on the Azores which aims to create a federated network for managing uh, and processing Atlantic data, and also with the potential for, uh, for launch capabilities for, um, for microsatellites. So our today's speakers are world leading experts in many of the, of the, uh, of the science pieces that I've touched upon. Uh, we have the first speaker is Professor Marie Baja from the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, I will introduce him in more detail once we uh, go into the session. Uh, his presentation will be on space traffic uh, challenges and transdisciplinary solutions that tie together academia and industry partners. The second speaker will be Professor Byron Tapley, also from the University of Texas at Austin. Um, <clears> this <throat> presentation will be on defining the roles of miniature satellites in observing the Earth. 
And then we'll have a brief break. And then after the break, uh, Professor Christina Larson from the University of Colorado at Boulder will talk about uh, a very uh, unique and, and interesting uh, way to uh, monitor the Earth, which is GPF, uh, GPS reflectometry to study the Earth. Uh, and all of the presentations will be uh, have follow on by a roughly 10 minute Q&A that you have to have. And then after all of these presentations, um, my colleague, Professor Luisa Bastos will uh, wrap up the session uh, and for, for the day. And with that, um, since uh, especially since Mariba will have to leave us early, um, it's good to be on time here and uh, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. So, uh, very pleased to welcome uh, that person, Mariba Ja. He's an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin with tenure in the Department of Aerospace Engineering and Engineering Mechanics. Uh, he's also a core faculty at the Odin Institute for Computational Sciences and Engineering. And he holds the Perley, the Scheele Henderson Centennial Fellowship in Engineering. Dr. Jha's research focuses on non-gravitational astrodynamics, uh, advanced um, and non-linear multi-sensor objects tracking, prediction and information fusion, space object detection, tracking, identification and characterization, and spacecraft navigation. Prior to being at UT, Dr. Jha was the director of the University of Arizona Space Object Behavioral Sciences. Um, uh, that, I think there's a typo here. But uh, yeah, he has also led the Air Force Research Lab, uh, Advanced Sciences and Technology Research Institute for Astronauts. Among Dr. Jha's multiple national and international services and recognitions, Dr. Jha is a member of the Astrodynamics Technical Committee of the International Astronautic Federation, permanent member of the Space Treaty Technical Committee of the International Academy of Astronautics. He's also a fellow of the International Association for the Advancement of Space Safety, the Air Force Research Lab, the American Astronomic Society, the Royal Astronomical Society, uh, among uh, others. Dr. Jai earned his PhD in aerospace engineering from the University of Colorado at Boulder, and he's a world-recognized subject matter expert in astronomics uh, based space domain awareness, sciences and, and technologies. And he will talk to us today about this topic. And he's been invited lecturer uh, and keynote speaker of um, many, many national and international space events. And he's also uh, a TED fellow. You should uh, check out his presentation on, on TED. And so uh, I welcome Dr. Ja and who he will uh, talk about uh, space traffic challenges and transdisciplinary solutions tying academia industry together. And so the floor is yours. Yeah, no, thank you for uh, uh, such an elaborate uh, introduction. I, I will say that I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to, to be uh, part of this. Uh, it's my first time interacting uh, with uh, Portuguese counterparts. And uh, I also wanna say that um, uh, I feel um, extremely honored to, to be in the same session with uh, uh, Professor Tapley, uh, who is my, my advisor's advisor. Uh, so, so I feel, uh, uh, hopefully, I'll 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 bring bring some good 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 honor to uh, to his legacy and and of my advisor and 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 to Professor Tapley himself. So uh, let me try to go ahead and do this screen sharing thing. And of course, with technology, we we know it always works. So we'll uh, go ahead and try this screen sharing, and hopefully, people can see my slides. Yes, we can. Okay, can you see that full screen? Yes. All right. So we're going to go through you, uh, three minute warning. Is that? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fine. Okay, Perfect. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, lo I love it when people interrupt me, man. It's, it's beautiful. All right. So here we go. Um, so <clears throat> let's start off by laying the groundwork. Um, we have we have a population of anthropogenic space objects, anthropogenic meaning human derived uh, and of, 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 of all the objects that are derived from some human activity. We track about 26,000 of these things ranging in size from about a cell phone all the way to the space station. They're in different uh, orbital planes and we'll chat about that a little bit. But I say assumed population here because uh, NASA's Orbital Debris Program Office at Johnson Space Center in Houston uh, hypothesizes uh, roughly about half a million objects if we go down to about a millimeter in the diameter, but we can't track those for a variety of reasons. So, uh, you know, of, of, of the 
hypothesize, you know, half a million, we can only track about 26,000 of these. And then of those 26,000, about 3,000 of those are things that uh, provide services and capabilities like position navigation and timing, weather, uh, financial transactions, that sort of stuff. And then the rest is debris, garbage. Uh, so about 96% of the stuff that we track in space made by humans uh, is trash. So that's not, that's not so good. Um, this is a brief movie uh, by uh, Analytical Graphics. Uh, the dots are not to scale. Uh, and uh, just kind of showing location and, and how the population of anthropogenic space objects developed over the years since Sputnik. And um, you know, there's a couple of step responses that you'll see, one in 2007, which is when the uh, Chinese uh, use an anti-satellite uh, test to, to destroy a satellite in a high enough orbit. And then in 2009, uh, there was a collision between a couple of objects, one that was working, uh, Iridium and, and uh, a dead satellite, Cosmos, that belonged to Russia. And this is, a, this is just a simulation from analytical graphics kind of showing, uh, I guess, you know, qualitatively what one could expect when two things meet at the same place at the same time and their velocities don't match each other, uh, bad things happen. And so you can kind of see a debris cloud being generated and now this becomes many, many objects. Two objects become thousands or tens of thousands or more, uh, of which uh, most are probably untrackable. And then they're like random bullets that we have to rely on the strategy of hope to not run into. Uh, so the services and capabilities that we depend on are not protected. They're not guaranteed from one moment to the next. So that's not so good. Um, in the next few years, we're going to see lots of satellites being launched. We already uh, have licenses for 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 uh, for launching many satellites, and so these are just a few. Uh, several companies, you know, SpaceX with the Starlinks, they already have over 700 satellites on orbit. It's amazing uh, how in just a couple of years they went from like zero to like 700. And um, the fact that these circles uh, aren't completely uniformly distributed here should be of some concern because any overlaps mean that there's a, there's a common orbital neighborhood where uh, the traffic needs to be managed. And so, and we don't have any, we don't have any rules of the road. We don't have any space traffic rules. Yeah, so that's part of the problem. Uh, the domain itself is poorly monitored, meaning that we don't have eyes on the sky all the time, 24 uh, seven. So that's, you know, part of the issue. We also don't have, again, these space traffic rules. There's no real estate deeds. Um, you know, space is the common heritage of humankind, but it is kind of a squatter's rights in terms of first come, first serve. I mean, once, once you're occupying a specific orbital regime, uh, it's easy for you to then say, well, you know, don't let anybody else launch because, uh, you know, it's too dangerous. So effectively, there's a, a de facto ownership uh, um, you know, just because of, of, of occupying a specific space. There's a potential to make lots of money. So there's a new gold rush going on, uh, thanks to, uh, you know, Elon and Jeff Bezos. They've basically made access to, to space cheaper, easier. That's great, uh, but needs to be pursued with some responsibility. And we don't have uh, agreed upon norms of behavior to manage uh, that combined, uh, that, that common, common resource. <clears throat> So like I said, there's no space traffic rules. We have this thing called space situational awareness. Uh, basically it's decision-making knowledge uh, for, for things in space. And at the ground floor, we have uh, the space environment, which is extremely dynamic. And we have objects interacting in that environment, uh, gravitational uh, effects, particulates, radiative effects, uh, electromagnetic, and how do these uh, you know, environmental effects impact the behavior of these anthropogenic space objects? We know some of this, but we don't know it fu fully, uh, not exactly for sure, because there's uncertainty. So there's some hazards, um, but along with the hazards, there's also threats, meaning that uh, there's never been a domain of human activity that's been absent malicious behavior. So it's not just governments uh, saber rattling uh, on orbit. Oh, you know, Russia's doing this, China's doing that, the US is doing this. It's also companies because there's a lot of money to be lost or gained. And you better believe that uh, it'd be naive to think otherwise that a company wouldn't 
purposely do something to affect the bottom line of some competitor if they felt that they could get away with it. So that stuff has happened in the past. No reason to think that space is just a domain of just pure benevolence and, and uh, you know, having kumbayas and, and, and uh, pillow fights and whatnot. All right. So what should space situational awareness provide? If we want space to be more safe, if we want it to be more secure and long-term sustainable, we need to measure ourselves with how, how much does our work contribute to making it more transparent? What is it? Who does it belong to? What could it do? Uh, more predictable, right? So people can plan, get out of the way, minimize miscommunication and misinterpretation. There's a cultural aspect to that that I think people have not really uh, properly accounted for. Case in point, we have treaties uh, like the Outer Space Treaty, like uh, the UN Convention on the Registry of Space Objects and others that have been ratified by many countries. And yet, you know, people don't actually implement that the same way because it's up to interpretation and interpretation is in great part influenced by cultural aspects so that has to be a part of it and then we need to develop a body of evidence that could be used to hold people accountable for their behaviors in the domain so we have a few challenges one of the things that we uh, subscribe to is you know some kind of uh, set of uh, activities <clears throat> that one could, could uh, call uh, like an OODA loop, observe, orient, decide, and act. And so this is what we've implemented at UT Austin at the Texas Advanced Computing Center through Astrograph, which I'll talk about here in a little bit, is that observations by themselves aren't necessarily useful. Those observations have to be mapped uh, into a lingua franca. They have to be curated, have to be conditioned uh, so that they can be exploitable, uh, so that they can, they can serve the purpose of various analyses and queries and these sorts of things. So, so we've basically invested a lot in that orient piece in the data modeling, engineering, and curation so that we can have uh, different queries and applications pull from that, 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 that now curated knowledge base uh, to make decisions and hopefully lead to meaningful actions. Astrodynamics 101, uh, this is just to say, look, there's a number of things that influence motion of objects in space. That's what astrodynamics is, the science that studies uh, and, and assesses motion of objects in space. So there's this thing called Earth. It has uh, something called the gravitational field. Um, for those of you that are more into the Einstein thing, then okay, yeah, there's a, uh, there's this thing called Earth and, and its mass basically kind of uh, shows other bodies how they need to behave in space-time curvature. Uh, we have the moon, we have the sun, and then we have so things like solar radiation pressure, non-gravitational effects, these photons interact with various surfaces of the satellite. Uh, some, some amount of that radiation gets reflected, one minus that gets absorbed, and then some fraction of that absorbed energy gets remitted thermally. Um, you have the planet that also reflects some of these photons, also emits, remits uh, this, and this absorbed energy thermally as well, and uh, you know even antenna recoil, depending on how much power comes out of the antenna, Newton's third law sort of thing. We have tidal effects and then relativistic effects as well. So there's a number of things we need to account for in terms of assessing and predicting motion of these anthropogenic space objects. <clears throat> I told you that space environment affects and impacts. We understand some of these things. They can wreak havoc uh, on, on operations and, and, and on the health and status of these objects, but also influence their motion. Why is this important? Well. You know, when we launch a lot of satellites, we, we expect a certain service uh, and capability, but when things don't work out well, we want to know why. Can we attribute cause to any sort of anomalies, any loss uh, or, or disruption or degradation of a service or a capability? And the thing about SSA is that most often than not, multiple hypotheses explain the same evidence, and so there's ambiguity. And ambiguity is not good for decision making. So. We need to really understand, science needs to focus on really understanding uh, how mother nature can contribute to loss, disruption, or degradation of the services so that when these things happen, we don't uh, have our finger on a red button ready to do something to somebody else thinking that it was necessarily uh, malfeasance, but we need to be able to tell the difference. Uh, our field also suffers from confirmation bias or what I call belief inertia. Um, we see this all the time. It's a very dangerous thing, especially for decision-making in a, in a shared uh, environment. 
And so we, in our own research, we want to be very allergic to this belief inertia. We want to make sure that whenever we see something that disagrees, whenever we have evidence that seems to disagree with something we believe, we should consider that maybe uh, our belief might need to change. And so people are very, uh, very quick to just call anything that disagrees with their belief an outlier. We see that all the time, uh, even computationally. And so we just need to be very aware and, and uh, reluctant to just immediately say that it's spurious or basically it's nonsensical. One of the reasons that we need to share uh, information is that no single entity has a, the complete picture and understands everything fully. And there's a lot of strength in being able to combine disparate sources of information, especially if the information content uh, itself uh, is, is complementary. Uh, and we see this all the time. And so we, we, we are firm believers in multi-sourced information. If you went to see the space traffic map uh, given the U.S. Department of Defense's opinions, you might see something like this. If you ask the Russians what their opinion is, you might see something like that. Those two things don't look exactly the same. Uh, so that is an issue. Uh, who's right? Who's wrong? Uh, what do you believe about what's up in space? Moreover, if you just look at a common object, just one, this is a flock 1C10, belongs to Planet Labs, you'll see multiple opinions about a common object. The difference in, 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 in location between these opinions is roughly a couple hundred meters, uh, but that could be the difference between getting hit and colliding and not. So, so we need to come up with a, a mechanism like a consensus filter that can process opinions as well as sensor measurements to come up with the berry sensor of these opinions, their strength in numbers, uh, to figure out what's the best uh, what's the best information from the combined information sources that could be provided back to the community to keep people safer, uh, to underwrite security in space and, and help towards long-term sustainability. We want to be able to tag and track objects. I told you that the, out of the 26,000, uh, only about 3,000 work, everything else is trash. You know what these things don't do? They don't report their identity because they're dead. So, uh, and we can't physically go up to these things and tag them. So we have to be a bit clever using math, using physics, uh, using mul multimodal data to be able to get to the equivalent tagging and tracking, understanding the behavior of individuals in this anthropogenic space object population, looking at their spatiotemporal evolution, testing hypotheses, identifying correlations between say space environmental effects, and some of their behaviors, and then hopefully being able to discover causal relationships uh, in that population. Difference between detecting stuff and tracking stuff uh, is here. Here's, here's a, a set of detections from the Space Surveillance Telescope currently located in Australia. This is a single night's worth of detections, uh, all the dots. The dots that are black are detections that we believe we know the identity of the objects. Everything else is unknown. So every night, this is kind of the, what this sensor produces. Just clutter, a bunch of background of stuff that we just don't understand, don't know, can't predict future orbits, that sort of thing. So that's a problem. So detecting is insufficient. It's necessary, but insufficient. We need to get to the tracking, which means also identifying. Said yet another way, we have an identity crisis in space that we need to uh, figure out. If we have multi-sourced information uh, from different times and different places and that sort of thing. How do we combine all of these uh, things that are not self-reporting to then solve that inverse problem and determine the unique identity of objects in space? One of the mantras that I have my students you know, uh, recite is if you want to know something, you have to measure it. And if you want to understand something, you have to predict it. Prediction is the key to understanding for sure, but it all starts with measurement. And so if we start on the far left with the things that we can measure, we ask ourselves what combination of these measurables lead to insights in the physical characteristics of these anthropogenic space objects. What combination of those then uh, provide us insight into functional and operational properties and can we move further to the right and dare I say, develop a scientifically derived taxonomy or classification scheme of this anthropogenic space object population which does not exist to date. We've been leveraging things like ontologies which is just kind of a, a fancy way to say that we have a semantic, uh, semantically linked description of a domain. And the reason that we do this is because it facilitates uh, 
joining or linking disparate sources of information. This is a method that has enjoyed uh, uh, great success in big data science analytics. So, you know, I, I like to copy other people's uh, successes. What we have with astrograph is we have uh, this, we have semantics, uh, semantically linked uh, information uh, in this knowledge graph database. So we basically have three, three layers. We have a bottom layer, which is raw sources of information like two line elements, maybe sensor data, maybe uh, tweets uh, and, 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 and open source information. So we don't ask people to speak our language. We just collect things however we can. Uh, the middle layer, the mezzanine is the heart of everything. This is the logosphere. This is where we curate uh, information and have data models. Uh, here's an example with some schema, right? So we know we build interpreters from the instance data to map into the schema. And that way we can expose, uh, you know, different user queries or needs uh, basically to that common uh, knowledge base, to that co co common knowledge graph. So in the ob observe, orient, decide, and act, here's the observe part on the bottom floor. The orient is this middle ground, which we believe is probably the most critical. And then the decide and act comes from different users and queries that can now query that, uh, um, you know, that curated information. One reason to organize things this way is, uh, you know, I look at libraries. Basically, think of this middle layer almost like a digital library of sorts in the sense that, you know, people of all walks of life go to a common library. I've seen homeless people and rich people go to the library here in Austin. I've seen very old people and toddlers uh, looking at books in a common section. And so the thing is, we shouldn't build a, a, a system to just address a specific user uh, because that, then it's just not scalable. What we want is we want to organize and curate a digital library of knowledge about things in the domain and allow that common knowledge base to be exposed to a variety of user needs. So this, is, this gets to the transdisciplinarity. Why multi-source information, right? So um, here's, here's one user need. Uh, this is gonna be actually briefed today at the United Nations uh, with the IAU. They're gonna talk about these dark skies. Turns out that there are a lot of satellites being launched. These satellites, these anthropogenic space objects reflect sunlight. And uh, some astronomers are not very happy at that. So one thing that we've been asked to do is, can we come up with predictive models that could predict the light pollution to any given ground-based astronomer? The answer is yes. Uh, here's a first stab that we took. Uh, what you're gonna see, every single streak that you see is light reflected off of uh, uh, one of these anthropogenic space objects based on the current catalog uh, uh, maintained today. Uh, th what the, the colors uh, represent visual magnitude uh, larger numbers are dimmer. Uh, the human eye can see about six, but clearly astronomy can go much, much dimmer than that. So this is basically as if you were sitting on the site, here's on the celestial sphere uh, towards where the telescope could be pointing. And then this is the telescope's topocentric perspective uh, and the gray, grayed out area is below the horizon, okay? So anyway, this just gives you a movie starting off at, uh, at uh, sunset, uh, you know, at this telescope, I believe in Chile. And then you can see as the night progresses, uh, you don't see as many streaks uh, in the visual range because uh, objects are getting eclipsed and that sort of thing. But the higher altitude objects are still reflecting uh, sunlight, still reflecting photons uh, towards this observatory. And then you're gonna see that uh, uh, the swarm is gonna start kicking up again as we go uh, from, from, from night to, to, to dawn, to sunrise. So this is what astronomers have to deal with uh, every, every night, and, and it's not getting better. So that's a topic of discussion, and actually, like I said, it's, it's happening today. So that's one user need, okay? Um, other people want to know, well, you know, the, the, the biggest culprit for the space debris is that people are just do not comply with space debris mitigation standards. Okay, well, how would you know who's complying and who isn't, unless you're, like, measuring it? You know, you, if you want to know something, you got to measure it. So we decided to do that. Could we build some schema within astrograph that could address compliance and non-compliance with some uh, space debris mitigation guidelines? The answer is yes. We decided to take a look at geodisposal uh, uh, space debris uh, mitigation guidelines. We built, again, th these ontologies or schema to implement within this knowledge graph database. 
and then users can just go to this like compliance website, for instance, click on it and do some queries to see, you know, who's complying and who's not complying with this. And so now that can be brought to the public square. That's another user, right? Demand is the policy person, but it's a common, the astronomer and the policy person, common, common set of knowledge that they're querying an astrograph. Here's the third. Some people want to be able to uniquely identify objects. We decided to take a look at, could we uh, leverage biometric techniques to do this with anthropogenic space objects? Much like in biometric techniques that you have this three tiered process of enrollment, verification and identification, could we use remote sensing to interrogate these anthropogenic space objects and put them through these processes? And the answer is we believe the answer is yes, at least for a subset of these. We're going to exploit reflected photons from objects, uh, much like Claude Shannon, uh, 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 you know, talked about information theory uh, back in, in, in the late 40s. Um, we believe that this is an information system and in that the transmitter is the anthropogenic space object. The encoding process is the interaction of these photons with the different surfaces of this anthropogenic object. The channel is the free space optical link established between uh, that anthropogenic space object and the observer. And then the receiver and the decoding process happens with measuring the photons and then interpreting the information content of these photons. And we try to reconstruct. These photons are carrying information about this object that they interacted with. Can we be the Sherlock Holmes of, of, of sorts and interpret and reconstruct uh, you know, the, the anthropogenic space object based on that? So uh, Topex, something that's probably near and dear to the heart of Professor Tapley here, uh, very well known, very well understood uh, uh, anthropogenic space object. So uh, we collected 50 kilohertz, uh, uh, you know, we count with a photon counter, we counted photons at 50 kilohertz. And here you have the minutes of, of the pass of the, of the object. We, we understand the inertial to body orientation. That's the first thing that we do with the light curve data. Light curve is just the, 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 the time rate uh, the time history of the, the measured photons. And then we kind of see the intensity as a function of time. So as you go around the, the, the body frame of Topex, you can see what the response was from real data uh, from, from the reflected photons, okay? So we get this light curve. And again, we're exploiting uh, our understanding of, of, of reflectivity. And the next thing that we do is we imagine that we have a unit sphere around the body. Then we see from the body frame, where did photons get reflected? We build a sort of heat map or flux, photon flux on this unit sphere. We unravel that unit sphere on a 2D proje projection called a Mulvite projection. And then this Mulvite projection is now what we call a quanta photogram. This is the fingerprint of Topex. So uh, this is real data. Um, what you see here is you see there, there, there are these gaps that you see in the quanta photogram. That's because we actually didn't observe those parts of Topex. So we're showing you which parts of Topex were actually observed. And the cool thing is you see some interesting features. This is the front of Topex. This is the side. So we have some specular reflections from the front and side of Topex. And then we believe this diffuse uh, reflection comes from the backside of the solar panels. So the question is, if we did this on a couple of nights, would we see pervasive features, things that are persistent? And the answer is yes. These things don't look identical, but guess what, on different nights, you can see that some of these features are actually persistent. So this is great news because we believe that we can come up with a fingerprint that uniquely identifies Topex and put it through this biometrically inspired space object recognition system. Will it work for everything? No, but it'll work for some things. And if we looked at that unit sphere that I talked about from the top down, for, uh, just on the Northern hemisphere uh, at the data we collected, the interesting thing is we see this asymmetry of this kind of diffuse reflection, we believe that that's self-shadowing from the solar panel. So that's pretty cool and we're very excited and we're just starting off with that. So I'm just gonna wrap this up with saying, um, you know, uh, Rudolf Emil Kalman had many awards. Uh, I learned how to use Kalman filters because of George Bourne and, 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 and him because of Professor Tapley, uh, which I'm greatly indebted again. And uh, one of the things that uh, Kalman said at uh, his Kyoto Prize in the 60s was, whenever a model is built, 
it's always proper to ponder the basic scientific question, is the model really based on the data or is an artifact displaying the prejudices of its creator? I'm very sensitive to trying to be as prejudice free in what we infer about these objects. It's not easy to do that, but uh, this is something that echoes within me. So uh, I always try to make sure that the outcome of, of, of my inference uh, is as unbiased as possible uh, uh, so that I can actually learn from the data and just not fall into this uh, you know, confirmation bias. Thank you very much. Uh, wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Mariba. Um, and great, we have uh, time for questions. Let me see the. So I urge the panelists to e uh, ideally uh, put in the Q and A. You can also, you might. I, I see all the panelists. You might have the ability to raise your hand if you like to ask a question. So um, please, please, uh, please do this. This is a class, right? So we're. <laughs> so. Um, uh, while we wait for questions from the attendees or the panelists, um, let, me, let me get started. I mean, this is really a fascinating topic and it shows very nicely the combination of um, observations and modeling, how you really take all the simulation capabilities to fuse these. Maybe a question, this um, to realize such a, um, what you call a, um, a monitoring and, um, and system and, and compliance testing system, uh, the computational capabilities, what would it require? Would you require like a big center that um, that has all the compute power to do this in an operational manner? And what would that take? Is that is that is there some numbers for this available or? Well, so, so the thing is, we're still in the infancy of, 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 of understanding these things. But but I will say that um, the goal is to have like um, a cloud enabled service where people can have different criteria. And then basically this can be, you know, this can be farmed out over many, many uh, uh, computer cores to do this sort of analysis and then provide the user back with, yep, compliant or non-compliant, but, but innate, do it like a cloud enable service. That's, that's kind of what we're trying to aim for with this. Okay. Okay. So yeah, again, attendees, please, this is a class so you'll get, um, points for participation. So please <laughs> ask questions. Um, yeah, I, I, mean, think, I, I think I think one, one go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was no, going to say uh, one, one thing that I want to do while while people uh, try to ponder some questions is I'm just going to share share this thing called a conjunction streaming service. And basically what we've done is uh, this is a public facing website and uh, it shows you based on about 20,000 uh, objects, out of the 20,000 over the next 20 minutes, which, which pair are predicted to come within 10 kilometers of each other over the next 20 minutes. So this is the current picture, uh, qualitative of what's going on, mostly in low earth orbit. Uh, you can see the, the, the histogram altitudes here. It's crazy. I mean, part of this that you see right here, this spike that you see around 500 or so kilometers, that's the Starlinks. And then you have this other spike around 800. That's like sun synchronous with all the debris and stuff from, from the Chinese ASAT. So these things have implications. Relative velocities that you see here, you see a spike at about 15 kilometers per second. I got to tell you something. When two things meet with a relative velocity at 15 kilometers per second, some not so great things are going to happen. So this is what, I mean, these are not collisions. These are conjunctions. 10 kilometers is not, you know, five meters. It's 10 kilometers, right? But it just shows you it's not zero traffic, so. <laughs> so we have a question from uh, Luisa Basto. So let's see, I can unmute you if you wanted to ask you, I can also read it, um, whichever. Uh, actually, well, let me, let me read uh, her question. So, okay. um, uh, so oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> okay, I, I forgot that I could uh, come on, on the video. So my, my question for uh, Moriba was, um, how do you foresee the resolution of the problems raised by space debris, uh, because they are a lot, and uh, how to identify this uh, and, uh, and remove it from, to, to avoid collisions? Yeah, so, so uh, I, have some, I, have, I have some bad news. Um, part of the bad news is we'll never be able to clean all the debris. So, so we're going to have to learn how to live 
within some of our own filth, uh, for lack of a, a, a better better term. So there's so there is that we can do things to to mitigate creating more debris, and part of that means compliance. And I think that you know you can't force people to do it. So this is why I'm trying to bring it to the public square to be able to uh, show the public who is and who's not compliant with this stuff and hopefully put some pressure uh, on that way. But there are some big rocket bodies that we know uh, they're just ticking time bombs. Eventually these will collide or explode and become smaller pieces. People could go and clean those up. But the thing is there's three countries responsible for these rocket bodies and they're not rushing to go get those, Russia, China, and the US. So um, I don't know, it's, it's, it's very complicated. Thank you, Moriva, and thank you for the excellent talk. It was thank really- Thank you so much. Uh, oh. yes, you're Patrick, muted, if Patrick. there's an opening in there, there's a question I would maybe like to address to Moriva if it's, if it's appropriate. Yes, please. Uh, uh, Marie, excellent presentation, by the way. Uh, thank you for a wonderful job there. Um, uh, in this SpaceX massive launching mode that they're underway with right now going into it, do they actually assume the responsibility for doing the catalog uh, determination for their own satellites going out of it? So they're just throwing them up there. And what we get is what comes out of the actual. Uh, yeah, NASA. yeah. So, 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 so the thing is this. Um, I'm 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 actually partially I'm actually partially infuriated by this. Um, so SpaceX they have GPS receivers they 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 can figure out their own orbits. They provide they provide uh, some 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 predictions uh, you know to to U.S. Space Command. But basically they say you know what under Article uh, un, under Article Six of the Outer Space Treaty we're not responsible for space traffic. So they they say. You know, Article Six of the Space Treaty says states are responsible for providing authorization and continuing supervision of all activities of non-government state actors in space. So they they've washed their hands of that. They say, hey, we're giving people GPS receiver, uh, not people, but the, you know, Space Command and 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 the whole catalog maintenance stuff. Like, you know, that's that's a government responsibility. Like, we don't have anything to do there. And it's like, I don't agree with that. Like that, that can't be the right answer. So um, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm not happy with that. Great, that's an interesting problem. Maybe to follow up on this, wouldn't it be long-term in their own interest because it's their, their private company assets that are increasingly put at risk? Patrick, and here's, here, let, me, let me tell you something, brother. Yeah. I have had conversations with SpaceX. I've gone to Hawthorne to explain this. And for whatever reason, they still believe space is big. And that's their perspective. It's not a good situation. Okay, well, that's, uh, that's depressing. Um, <laughs> yeah. And um, I mean, the, it gets into this interesting also into legislation. Um, and you mentioned that you are, you know, you're going uh, aspects like the, the light source is being discussed at UN. Uh, well, now, of course, there is contempt in some countries for what the UN says, but uh, is there any vision of maybe having some international, you know, we have the law of the seas, which is at least one of the best working international laws that there is. Um, is, would, is that something where this is headed um, in international law of space? It, 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 it's headed that way. It's just, it's very slow. It's headed that way. Um, I'm just trying to make it as publicly known as possible. Excellent. So, and and maybe finally, so what what's sort of the major the research tr thrust? And and if you see, you know, in this context, UT Portugal um, is it, I, I like it would be really great yeah. to see sort of stronger connections between some of the research yeah. and engineering capabilities of these two entities. It would be great to sort of have a vision of where. Yeah. So where so so I'll, I'll say this right. I mean. We, we don't fully understand the effects and impacts of space environment on, on the behavior of the population. So I would say scientifically, that's a great place for us to, to, to combine forces. It, it, it is a big data problem if we try to solve it correctly because we have to get all the space environmental models. 
We have to get as much information about these objects and their physical characteristics to understand the non-gravitational uh, effects and impacts. And then through this combination uh, and curating this stuff digitally, like I, I explained, maybe we can apply some AI ML uh, techniques to see if we can go from data to discovery to understand things in, in this kind of hyper-dimensional you know, information cube uh, that will give us some, some more insight. So I think, I think the computational engineering uh, and science aspect of this for sure, uh, the astrodynamics, but coupled with the space environment phenomenology, and then the AI ML to kind of, uh, kind of under, underwrite uh, all these activities, I think that's the way of the future. Okay, wonderful. Well, maybe these are some great um, sort of uh, concluding words. Uh, and uh, I see no more questions. And so thank you so much again for a wonderful presentation. And um, yeah, I will really look forward to your, your work in the future. And um, yeah, fortunately, you have to leave us now. But uh, yeah, thanks, thanks, for, thanks for, for presenting. Thank Bye. you so much, everybody. Cheers. Stay safe and healthy. Yeah. Okay, so now we let's uh, switch to uh, Dr. Byron Tapley, and let let's see if um, you Byron you have the ability to share your screen. Yes, let's see. Where's the screen sharing version here? So you, at the at the bottom, the green there's a green. Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I see it here. Yeah, I was looking up at the top up there. Yes, yeah, share. Okay. It says I am. Let's yep, see. We can see we can see your screen. Um, so, okay, good. Yeah. Let's see. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, so this is in full screen mode. We can see it. Uh, we are two minutes, uh, three minutes ahead. But I, unless there's any objection. I would suggest that we get started. That gives just more time to uh, present and to discuss, or or maybe let's let's maybe wait two more minutes just to make sure that we are we stay on on, on track. Um, Okay, maybe what I will do is um, sort of uh, to bridging the two minutes, uh, I would like to introduce uh, our next speaker. It's a big pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Byron Tapley. Uh, he is a Claire Cockrell Williams Centennial Chair Emeritus in Engineering and Professor Emeritus of Aerospace Engineering and Engineering Mechanics in the Cockrell School of Engineering here at the University of Texas at Austin. Among Dr. Tapley's groundbreaking work are a wide range, for example, increasing the accuracy of nearly every data collected from Earth orbiting satellites with his visionary engineering methods and applications using dynamics theory, laser ranging, and the emerging global positioning system. Contribution to the success of many historic NASA missions, including topics Poseidon, uh, GRACE, the Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment, of which he led, uh, uh, GRACE he led uh, as a principal investigator. His advancements of the discipline of geodesy from space is used um, in many of today's studies of the Earth and in areas of geodynamics, geophysics, oceanography, climate change, all of which have benefited from the revolutionary advances. Among his many services and awards are most recently the 2018 NASA Distinguished Public Service Medal, which is NASA's highest honor awarded to any non-government individual who has personally contributed to NASA's achievement of the United, of the United States interests. He is, has been a long time, uh, time member of the National Academy of Engineering, the recipient of the American Geophysical Union Charles Whitten Medal, uh, American Astronomy Society Dirk uh, Brower Award, honorary doctorate from the University of uh, Delft, and the NASA Medal for Exceptional uh, Science Achievements. And this is just a um, um, an incomplete list of, of awards and services. For over 60 years, Dr. Tapley has been a researcher, educator, and visionary, and, and 
here at UT Austin, he has supervised more than hundreds of students. Um, he served as a department chair uh, in for the aerospace engineering and engineering mechanics. Um, and in 1981, uh, in collaboration with NASA, he established here at UT the Center for Space Research, which he directed for over 46 years. So really a, a very distinguished career. And um, so we're really, really glad to have Dr. Tapley talk to us today on the defining roles of miniature satellites in observing the Earth. Uh, please, Dr. Tapley, you have the floor or the, the screen, so not the floor. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, uh, Patrick. It's a real pleasure to be able to uh, um, share this uh, discussion uh, with the group this morning. The uh, uh, topic that uh, we want to talk about this morning essentially has a number of facets tied into it. it um, uh, assuming that the idea of how we go about making space measurements is not totally familiar to everyone, we thought we'd make a few comments up front about the, what's involved in actually making uh, precise scientific and metric type measurements and uh, the role that satellites play in terms of their studies. And part of this has been foreshadowed by the, the points that um, uh, Professor Hammock and uh, both Professor Jai both made going forward into it. And so I'll rely on those and not repeat a lot of the detail that they've been into. We'd want to focus on the discussion in the uh, use of the satellite to provide information in Bureau System Studies mode. Uh, this essentially involves both the measurement process, interpretation of measurements, modelings, and then creating a series of products that we use in both applications and in scientific uh, studies. Uh, the uh, measurement requirements for a complicated process that's related to studying their system uh, is that we really want data everywhere, global data. We want homogeneous data that is in, we can pick it up. Clearly, accuracy is important. The biggest single facet in looking at your studies is the synoptic or near synoptic type measurements. That is, we'd like to have these measurements that are homogeneous and they're accurate and they're global. We'd like to have them all collected at the same time. Uh, the first three is something that we can get uh, in most measurement pro approaches. The last one is very difficult to come up with. Uh, in a lot of the actual utilizations of the data, when you get over into the applied science and the actual applications area, then how quickly can you get the data is important latency. And there's always the ongoing uh, uh, tension in the satellite based measurements between the spatial resolution you can get and the temporal resolution. And so we would like that problem solved. Uh, all of these requirements have implications for the way you put the uh, satellite on orbit and the way you make the measurements or the mission architecture. And uh, we will look a little bit at what's being done currently. And for the small satellite mode, the challenge in terms of this, there's obvious benefits for using small satellites from the cost point of view and from some of the innovative ways that one can think about putting the architecture in place. The real demand is being able to achieve the actual measurement uh, precision accuracy that's in the larger satellite mode. We want to take a look at a set of requirements from the GRACE mission, how this is made, how it's used, what the science results would look at, and look at the idea of what one might be able to bring to bear in terms of the gravity measurements from a small satellite mode. And this also ties together in terms of an altimetry and the interdisciplinary mode goes into it. And I've picked both the gravity and the altimetry because that's the basis of a couple of the actual studies that we're collaboratively doing uh, with the, uh, with the uh, colleagues in Portugal. And we'll briefly summarize that collaborative activity as, as we close out the activities. Uh, the satellite imagery that we're thinking about comes into uh, two versions. It can be either what we call passive uh, sensing or active sensing. In the passive sensing, this is sort of the sort of thing that we would get if we were thinking about putting a camera, looking at an object and measuring the uh, reflection of the sun's energy as it comes back in to get the picture or the, uh, the image that we, that we correct. If we think about replacing the sensor with a satellite, putting it on orbit, we then find something like the thing on the right hand side in which the sun illuminates features on the Earth's surface. The energy is reflected. Satellite on the orbit collects the sensor, uh, collects the data. As the satellite overflies the surface of the Earth, the data is recorded. And at appropriate places where it's over ground stations, it downlinks that data. And we do the uh, image reconstruction and the uh, point on the surface of the ground. I don't have enough trouble here with this going forward. Uh, <clears throat> the alternate version in terms of the passive sensing in which the sun uh, or 
this we could replace the sun by just thermal heating, heating the earth on the front side, get infrared radiation on the back side. But the sun will effectively would be the source of the illumination. We can replace this with what we would call active sensing, say in the radar of the microwave range in which a signal is transmitted to the earth. Uh, it's reflected from the earth, comes back and is collected again as the satellite flies over the surface of the earth and is downlinked. Uh, the majority of the actual remote sensing uh, results that uh, that we will see today come out in terms of this image reconstruction. In the discussion that we go forward, we'll essentially uh, focus mostly on a subset of these that are metric related and relate rich originally in time-based or range-based determinations. Most of these uh, measurements that are shown here are radiance type measurement modes and uh, that are used to, uh, to come up with the image that we'd come up with. And what we'd want to look at is a, as a subset of those that essentially are based on a single point measurement, the path that the uh, energy would travel as it goes down and goes back. I'll get in more to that as we go into it. Uh, following up on what uh, Professor Jai indicated earlier, there's a very busy uh, set of uh, uh, orbits on orbit. A subset of those are these uh, uh, mission related or purposely related satellites that's put on orbit. There's a very large cluster that NASA has that up there. Uh, the US version is made up with uh, the uh, satellite cluster uh, supplemented by the, uh, by the uh, NOAA and USGS cluster where the uh, satellites that NASA has put up there focuses on the exploratory and science related issues. NOAA focuses more on the continuing operational measurements, the weather, the uh, land agricultural needs going forward in terms of it. Uh, the uh, cluster of these uh, uh, satellite missions has a strong international collaboration and the uh, collaboration between the international agencies in order to meet the very large demands in the Earth system science remote sensing needs uh, is, is very evident both in this one and when you look to the uh, ESA representation, you get the same representation. There is, it doesn't come through this uh, uh, slide here, but there, uh, there's a cluster, there's a cluster of slides here where it represents the latest uh, introduction from NASA looking at small set and a number of demonstration missions and uh, uh, study missions are being planned. So the idea of looking for a place within this established cluster where small sets could play a role is evident in, the, in both the planning and all the national agencies. Uh, and if we look at the East, we look at the, I'm not sure what's happening to the computer here, but if we look at the ESA, uh, representation. They've got a cluster of ongoing satellites, some of them dominated by the meteorological mode. They have a series of one-time measurement modes in which they put them up and essentially demonstrate a measurement. A subset of those become important and they're essentially put out in repeated measurements. And this continuity issue of being able to need to continue the measurement going forward is one of the other things that goes forward. NASA originally was uh, fly the mission one time and then uh, turn it over to NOAA if it's to be continued. But because of the need from climate measurements for sustaining observations over a long time period, NASA now is looking at trying to essentially bring in the sustained measurements within the portfolio of missions that they're looking at. And so we look at this large cluster of missions and raise the question of with the measurements that's being distributed up there, is there a role? And if so, where is the role for the small satellite? We'll be looking at that as we go through looking at what can be done, kind of look at that as, a, uh, as one of the uh, places or opportunities where we might think about trying to add to or replace some of the measurements with a smaller satellite implementation. Uh, the sort of science applications that comes out of these is uh, broken up into a large of uh, processes that are important to the uh, academy. There was a detailed look by the uh, uh, national uh, uh, academies in uh, uh, published in 2018 for uh, the 2017 NASA DEC data survey, which recommended the sorts of measurements that ought to be made, ought to be sustained, and identified a series of new measurements that need to be made in order to fill, fill gaps that are going forward, recommending the mission profiles for carrying those out. Uh, there is, in, in addition to the SAS mode, a whole host of the uh, application related areas, a hazard response. I picked something in 2017, and uh, Dr. Kamak mentioned earlier on the uh, the fact that we're right now in a very active hurricane season. This was uh, 2017 was when Harvey came ashore three times in a period of four or five days along the Gulf Coast, dumped an enormous amount of water. I uh, had uh, 
you might have to shut down a mouse in here. I've got an active mouse that keeps triggering this version. Uh, that, but we have the uh, uh, Irma uh, hitting the Tropic Keys and Maria striking Puerto Rico. We had a cluster of wildfires in the, uh, in the uh, western part of the US uh, reminiscent to what we've just gone through this year. Uh, two major earthquakes that were tracking things. And all of these essentially placed demands on the remote sensing for data to interpret uh, the uh, phenomena to monitor what's going on, to come up with uh, information to help <clears throat> uh, manage the response to the actual event and then to uh, uh, look at the damage assessment in a post-flight mode. So these uh, are the sorts of things that comes out of the needs that one would need for the, for the data. Uh, when we look at what, why one would think about the small sets, one of the big issues that's been identified is that uh, small sets uh, have a reduced development and launch cost. Uh, they uh, uh, require smaller and cheaper launch vehicles. You can actually bundle them together and launch them in multiples and defer the launch cost. They can be uh, looked at targets of opportunity uh, as posted payloads in which uh, if there's excess capability on scheduled launches, one can actually add on the small satellite. And the cheaper fabrication and mass production are advantages in the construction. Uh, there have been studies by the academy, by the community, and other people looking at the niches where the satellites could, uh, uh, small satellites could play a role in supplementing and are adding to the value of the information gathered by the larger satellites. There's uh, unique sampling uh, requirements that one can define the satellites to look at. The constellation is really a, a very uh, important way of looking at making the measurements. This allows you to do multi-point sampling. Uh, it allows you to actually look at the questions of uh, the spatial temporal uh, uh, sampling conundrum. Uh, it's a test bed for new hardware. And a really important educational point of view is the cost benefit allows universities to think about building laboratories as parts of the additional educational activities. And it's a marvelous uh, teaching profile in addition to giving the uh, exposure to actually be able to uh, build satellites, put them on mission. There's a number of actually university-based uh, uh, satellites uh, in the small set mode that are actually are being in orbit, orbited and are planned for orbiting. And under the, uh, the uh, Portugal UT collaborative effort, uh, looking at small set capability for two important uh, Earth trends is one of the gist of what's underway. And so this uh, small set role, how we would fit this into this larger cluster that we're looking at is some one of the things we'd like to give some thought to this morning. Uh, the uh, two is institutions that will collaborate primarily with the, uh, with the activity in the small set development mode uh, sits within the Center for Space Research, which is uh, directed by uh, Dr. Schlinberg Bedecker. And uh, the, the sorts of things that uh, the center's been interested in runs the range of uh, the uh, imaging, ranging, uh, gravity. Uh, it's been involved um, in the altimetry, both the uh, radar and the laser altimetry, satellite anatrometry, and takes addition from the satellite, it goes into the extension to the airborne and terrestrial measurements, but the predominant is with, with the satellite, focusing mostly on studying the uh, Earth, the size, the shape, the gravity field, uh, a major emphasis in the surface features, the mass, the surface dynamics, and the sorts of disciplines that we are looking at in terms of the uh, trends are kind of run through this list of things on the right-hand side from the modeling, from the orbit mechanics, the determination, a range amount of signal processing and data analysis. This in requires uh, developing mathematical models and using the mathematical models in interpreting uh, the uh, satellite data that we have going forward. The other component study is a laboratory. That's the Texas Spacecraft uh, Laboratory directed by Dr. Uh, Brandon Jones. Uh, and there's a number of essential small satellites that essentially are have been constructed one in uh, collaboration with the Jet Propulsion Laboratory was to do an atmospheric monitoring mode that uh, uh, failed, there was a launcher failure and the uh, race satellite along with a number of others was lost in that going forward. But there's follow-up satellites looking at uh, uh, the uh, atmospheric related uh, issues. Uh, the the uh, two satellites related to the two projects that we're doing with Portugal will be essentially looked at as part of the activity going forward. There's a suite of other uh, missions that are uh, under planning and uh, that have uh, previous versions have flown that are related to looking at the uh, 
proximity operations, the absolute and relative position locations on that. Uh, we'll mention specifically a little bit of the details on the two missions later on going forward. So looking at this uh, background then, we'd want to look so essentially at the satellite role in the, uh, <clears throat> looking at the uh, Earth uh, system studies. Uh, uh, we note that the, uh, the, the Earth system itself evolves uh, in the interactions of a set of complex uh, dynamic, uh, uh, in, uh, dynamic systems, the uh, ocean systems, the atmospheric system, the uh, land hydrology system, and the cryosphere, the four major domains. Uh, each one of these has an interesting uh, interaction inside the system itself, but the cross transfer of energy momentum of uh, uh, mass between those systems, uh, radiance between those systems is an important uh, coupling that essentially uh, one needs to understand to be able to carry out the, uh, the predictions of the uh, system in, in the future. Uh, they, to be able to actually understand these interactions requires uh, multidisciplinary uh, research uh, effort uh, supported by uh, global and near synoptic observations. And the, the uh, global and the near synopticity can satisfy, the only practical way of really satisfying that is using the orbit. So uh, one can think about making uh, very detailed regional measurements with aircraft or surface measurements, but extending those over the oceans, over the pole to get them all over the entire global of the earth, uh, surface of the earth. A lot of them, they're political boundaries. It makes it difficult for you to get measurements at the surface or in the near surface environment. And so the satellites essentially allow one to, uh, to essentially uh, uh, address or attack this global mode. The near synopticity depends on how uh, the re repeat sampling time as a satellite overflies the surface of the earth. A single satellite makes it very difficult to get what you'd really want as synoptic observations. This is one place where numbers of satellites comes into play and one place where essentially the constellations and the clusters are, could have an important mode. In all of these things, when we go down looking at what can be done with the satellites on orbit and think about what we could do with the additional numbers of satellites, we have to be aware that the idea of increasing the number is something that uh, easily uh, can be done. The idea of maintaining the performance, the accuracy of the measurements and the, uh, the performance characteristics in this domain of the larger satellites is the challenge, the major challenge that one faces in looking at the uh, small satellite implementation mode. We'll look at this a little bit more as we uh, go along with it. Uh, we're going to focus essentially on this version here, essentially in the metric measurement mode. And one of the drivers on this is the role that gravity has in and uh, uh, looking, bringing information about this Earth system interaction. And uh, we know that the Earth's mass uh, varies as the geodetic position changes and its time changes. Uh, uh, the mass has a gravitational track, uh, effect and it's a consequence that we know that gravity would also vary with the geodetic position and uh, time. The picture here shows essentially uh, the uh, gravity signal essentially represented in a round ball and the gravity signal increasing would be representative of more dense mass representation, uh, the gravity signal uh, decreasing in terms of the uh, blue being a deficient, uh, the red being an increase, shows effectively the, uh, the uh, uh, mass, uh, uh, the gravitational signal shows mass deficiency there. So uh, the concept that we've looked at is that if we can actually come up with a way of uh, measuring this gravity over the surface of the earth and we can create this structure, if we can repeat those measurements, then we can look at changes in this particular structure from time. And so that the repeated global measurements of the gravity we used to in, infer the uh, mass distribution both in its mean sense, the average value of this repeated set of measurements and the departures from that mean and the temporal vari uh, variation. Uh, so the, uh, the, uh, that particular concept is the concept that we've used in gravity mapping missions and sort of the basis for what we use to put, put the uh, GRACE mission in place. Uh, in the measurement mode, we'd wanna think about actually the metric type measurements in addition to the uh, 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 the version we looked at before in the imaging and sounding, the sorts of measurements that we'll be focusing on on the two main themes in the presentation here will be in distance measurements, uh, accurate measurements of the distance, and there we would essentially classify.
classify those uh, measurements in terms of the uh, the uh, uh, time of flight, uh, we can think about uh, uh, the laser type ranging measurement as an example of this time of flight. We essentially uh, uh, send, send a signal of a pulse from a laser, a flash from a laser, which uh, travels to a satellite. It's reflected from the satellite, comes back and is uh, measured on the surface of the earth. And in the, the uh, simple mode on this, if we can measure the time of uh, the transmission or the time of the, of the, the pulse is transmitted and the time we return it, that gives us the two-way transmit time. If we essentially multiply that by the speed of light, we get effectively the path length that's traveled. We want just the distance, not the two-way distance. So we divide it by two and effectively get the distance that the satellite travels. It's complicated by a couple of factors, by the fact that the Earth is rotating and the satellite is moving. Uh, the satellite essentially was at the point of transmission when the pulse was transmitted. It essentially is at a, a point, a different point when the pulse is received. And so what we effectively get is uh, the point at the midpoint when we divide that by two, where the satellite is reflected from. And so we have to actually make uh, calculations in this uh, laser range type measurement for the Earth's rotation to get this two-way transmission. But the simplest thing is if everything was fixed this would be essentially a transmission reception that time multiplied by the speed of light would give you the distance. Uh, the actual corrections that need to be applied to this in the metric mode is that the actual speed of light we know is the speed of light in a vacuum. Uh, this signal is actually traveling through an atmosphere and it's if it's laser optical, it's retarded by that atmospheric transmission. So we need to make corrections uh, for that particular point in the overall version. But the simple idea of just that the range is equal to C delta T is at the heart of a lot of the measurements we're looking at. We make those measurements uh, in terms of accurate timing. We can also make them in terms of carrier phase. Uh, but still, again, the time comes to play. But the important difference between these type measurements and the image measurements is the uh, time factor turns out to be critically important. Uh, that that it's, it's one of the fundamental basis that adds complexity to the overall measurement that we would come up with. But if we look at this, then we can look at the, uh, the uh, actual uh, measurement type ranging on this is on the order of the uh, uh, millimeter type range precisions in the uh, surface to the satellite and back. Uh, we get similar type measurements of these with a different situation in the transmission of the data from the GPS satellites, if this happens to be a GPS satellite sending a, a, sending a radiometric signal to the surface of the Earth, collected on the surface of the Earth, we can uh, pick, uh, pick up essentially range type measurements from that point of view. So a lot of the things we're going to be looking at is going to be built about essentially measuring uh, this uh, very simple uh, type uh, concept and the techniques that we'd use for going about getting that to very accurate determinations. Uh, we talk about the actual centimeter type and uh, millimeter type determinations for the surface satellite measurements. In the uh, measurements we'll be talking about between the two gray satellites, this particular measurement we're looking at is in the micron type level. And so the, the ability to actually make these precise measurements brings a lot of information into the things that we're looking at in the uh, in the, uh, in the satellite mode. Uh, the, the distance measurement things that uh, we would have, that have been used in the past and have sort of set the basis for the uh, measurements we're looking at are sort of shown here. The, uh, the satellite that one uses in the laser ranging is a round ball with cube corners in terms of it. These are essentially like the corner of a room except they're optical reflectors. They have the property that if the light goes in, it's essentially reflected back along the path that, that goes into it. And so, uh, so uh, the satellites are dense, uh, covered, no, they rotate no matter where they're covered. There's these optical reflectors that are pointing towards the surface of the earth. And so they are very good, uh, good ranging targets. Uh, they've been up there, I think the LAGIO satellite, the first LAGIO satellite was uh, launched in, uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, 76 and it's essentially been, uh, uh, 78, uh, 76, and it's essentially been on orbit since that time frame with uh, very long lifetimes. There's been a cluster of those that's gone up and have played an important role in making earlier uh, gravity studies. Uh, the uh, the uh, GPS satellites uh, cluster is a point that, uh, that also can be used, and this is a topic that I'll uh, leave to Dr. Uh, uh, 
a person left for she will pick this up in the follow-on uh, discussion as we go forward on this the two that i'll spend most of the time talking about essentially is the gravity measurement missions and the height measurement missions going forward on it they play a very symbiotic role in the measurement that goes forward and one of the studies attempts to look at trying to what one might do to essentially build a small set uh, replication for the uh, altimeter related versions of the other looks at coming up with gravity measurements it fits in the domain of the grace and we'll have something to say about both of those as we go forward we'll look essentially at more details of what these two missions will be doing we look a little bit at what set the stage for this mission the gravity mission by what comes out of the uh, uh, the laser or the cannonball satellite studies the satellite observation community is essentially looking at this multi-decade uh, representation has done a number of important measurement suites that comes out of it. Uh, the first thing that comes in place on this is that when we begin to look at the gravity relations, um, the, uh, the oblateness factor of the Earth is one of the things that's very well observed by the laser ranging satellites. And this shows essentially a uh, time history since uh, the launch in uh, 1976 of Lagios up through, this actually runs up through 2007. This is an earlier slide, but we've actually carried it on out to the 2017. The important point to look at this, and when we put this series in studies, is there's a very large annual variation in this J2, uh, raising a question of why. There's also though, uh, this, uh, this uh, annual variation has superimposed in it a long-term trend, which has some structure to it and which has a slope change going into it. We've studied this over the time frame. We now understand by looking at this process from not only what we've learned from Legios, but from other uh, earth system studies that this really represents the uh, uh, moisture uh, exchange between the ocean and the land on a seasonal basis. Uh, this particular effect here, we uh, back early on in the 90s, uh, concluded that this is a function of the uh, post-glacial rebound, the earth rebounding from the loading of the last ice age, predominantly occurring over the uh, northern part of North America in Canada and in Scandinavia. But that particular trend essentially is still underway. There was a change in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, uh, and we uh, now understand that this particular change is uh, related to the ch uh, beginning of the melting of the polar ice caps. And so the difference between the purely uh, isostatic change and the trend that we're seeing in J2 now is influenced strongly by the combination of those two, where a lot of this is uh, polar ice sheet melting. We can see the effects of the El Ninos in which there's a disturbance in this annual pattern. Part of the water gets left on the land in that or uh, continental areas dry out in those El Nino events going forward. So one can see a fair amount of the of the climate related signals in this. The question poses in that if uh, these are the very active determinations in the global sense mode of these effects, the real question that comes into play is essentially where is this leaving the ocean? Where does it go to on the land? And in effect, at the point where we really looked at it, we had the post-glacial rebound. Where is essentially the post-glacial rebound structure occurring? A lot of the points I just made are things that we've learned by taking the grace measurements and essentially interpreting those later on. And we'll point at that point a little bit later on in terms of it. The other things in terms of the time varying uh, uh, signals associated with the tectonic motions coming out of the uh, lasers, the continental motions themselves, and another mass related <clears throat> signal associated with the <clears throat> seasonal displacement of the mass in which the uh, <clears throat> in which that mass displacement <clears throat> causes a displacement of the center mass of the earth with respect to the coordinate frame that one's describing essentially the earth and the satellite motion in it and you actually see the xyz motions in terms of the uh, the, uh, the uh, center mass. The uh, <clears throat> largest signal essentially is in the Z component, but you get the annual signals in both X and Y. Uh, this is an earlier result. This has become a, essentially a, a standard international geographical product that's to put out now mostly a consequence of this suite of the, uh, of the uh, SLR satellites. There's also information determined from the GPS measurements it feeds in into this. So these show large scale global type signals and an attempt of trying to go in and understand the earth system processes interactions 
from a regional point of view that's causing these that leads to needing to look at a more detailed level. Uh, the sea level change is one of the problems that's of interest to us. The global change in sea level is of concern, not only from the climate trend related effects, but also from the potential impact it'll have on uh, Earth, uh, on uh, communities that are near the ocean or built around the ocean areas that one goes forward. Uh, the two points that go into this is the uh, altimeter measurements uh, that uh, essentially uh, started in 1992 and have been running in a continuous mode since, and the uh, grace measurements. The altimeter measures the actual sea, uh, sea surface height. Uh, the uh, grace measures essentially the mass contribution to that. In the overall study, the actual uh, total global uh, height that's uh, influenced by the water or the water or the mass that's added to the ocean water predominantly and the volume changes in the ocean due to the heating of the ocean due to the thermal exp expansion and uh, there's interest in trying to understand the contributions how much of which of that goes into this uh, we can essentially come up with a um, estimate of effectively what is uh, uh, lost from the land area with the gray satellites uh, which essentially would give you uh, the uh, a prediction of what this would be. Grace also measures this directly, and so we have two ways of essentially looking at this particular uh, quantity, both from the grace measurements over the ocean and from the grace measurements of the actual water lost from the land and put in the ocean, both the ice melting and the pumping the underground aquifers and the other things that goes forward. So we want to look at those two again, how those measurements go forward again with the background mode. Is there a role for small sat to play in this series? And is there a role for small sat to play in augmenting and improving what's done with these two modes? Uh, the uh, importance of the grace is in twofold. One, the actual uh, gravity information that grace provides is an essential element in in making the altimeter measurements. Uh, when we first started the uh, Tobek Poseidon measurement going forward, one of the uh, requirements that came out of the uh, oceanographic community, uh, 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 Professor uh, Wunsch, who was essentially the big driver on helping get the science requirements out, uh, working with the community levied a requirement that the precision of the satellite needed to be known with an accuracy of five centimeters. That accuracy needs to be in a geocentric reference frame because one really wants the ocean surface in a geocentric reference frame, driven by the fact that the oceanographic information for the general ocean circulation is in the so-called dynamic topography, which is the departure of the uh, actual ocean surface from the equilibrium ocean surface that the water would go to if, the, if there were no uh, earth rotation, no winds, no forcing at all. The actually place the water would relax to this gravity defined surface called the uh, geoid. And so in the original uh, uh, representation, trying to come up with a five centimeter positioning of the orbit was limited by the knowledge of the gravity field. The tall pole in the gravity field was the uh, ability to actually compute the orbits accurately. And so uh, a gravity model effort was put under play to actually uh, come up with a gravity model that would allow us to actually meet those requirements. Uh, uh, in fact, actually the requirements were actually met at a roughly a two centimeter level in the actual mission timeframe for Topex. It's been carried forward and the GPS satellites, uh, the first mode was done with lasers and uh, radiometric tracking the system. But later the GPS has come on orbit, it's been the, uh, tracking system of choice and it's the one that's actually used for all of the follow-on satellite missions as the primary tracking device that goes forward. But the orbit uh, gravity information still is important in all of the computations. The geoid is necessary in order to be able to take this very accurate altimeter measurement and get this uh, oceanographic uh, information that one needs to, to be able to use to go forward with it. Uh, it also, and the other point we look at, we just mentioned that the actual uh, changes uh, in the overall observation, one of the interpretations involves needing to know how much the ocean mass changes uh, in, in order to be able to fully interpret the altimeter measurement. Uh, the other place that one would look at in this gravity mode is in this issue of the uh, water movement itself. 
uh, one of the places that the uh, that the uh, water leaves the ocean and goes to the land is through the evaporation. It's uh, picked up by the atmosphere. It's transported over the ocean and dropped on the land. Some of it in frozen, some of it in just uh, plain water. It runs back off and comes back into the ocean. There's a cycle in this particular change going forward. And uh, what's uh, the the uh, residual part of the ocean would indicate that there's uh, if the ocean is increasing, that part of this is left in the ocean. The amount of heat in the ocean essentially is one of the contributing factors to that. And so in order to understand this particular process, which is understanding the global water cycle, understanding the mass change is an important uh, point in that, a role in that. And up until the, uh, uh, the, uh, the gravity measurement became an important point, uh, there's very little information on this. And so one of the actual objectives of the GRACE mission was to come up with a set of global gravity measurements that would determine the mean global mass distribution and the uh, temporal variations in that, which would look at the time changing water mass over the ocean and over the land. The mean is an important facet for both the oceanography as well as looking at the uh, variations in terms of the quantum components. And so with these two sort of uh, scientific uh, background justifications, we'd go forward and talk a little bit about them. I'll talk a little bit about the GRACE mission because I'd like to put that in the context of understanding what it is we really need to, uh, to think about doing when we think about can the small satellite have a role to play within the GRACE mission? Uh, essentially, this mission is made up of uh, two satellites tracked by the GPS system, a very accurate inter-satellite ranging mode, and uh, each satellite effectively carries on board uh, the ability to measure the surface forces. Uh, uh, Professor Job mentioned the, uh, the, uh, the surface forces, the radiation pressure and the drag, and the ability to model those is one of the problems that essentially has been a problem over the time frame in doing the precise orbit determination, the precise data analysis. And so if we can put on board a very accurate means of measuring those, an accelerometer that measures those, and we don't have to worry about those models, the, uh, the actual accelerometer doesn't sense any of the actual gravity signal, it senses only the surface forces. So we can separate out that surface force from, from the, uh, <coughs> Uh, from the uh, actual gravity forces in the overall measurement. The uh, measurement mode that we'd talk, the, me the measurement mode that we talk about for the gray satellites is, is shown here. Uh, the uh, system overflies the surface of the earth. It overflies a fairly uh, complex mass variation in terms of spatial variations and temporal variations. It's got uh, moist elements of interest in the uh, near surface uh, called soil moisture. It's got deeper water uh, related uh, interest. It's got the uh, mass that's in the ocean and it's got the mass that's in the atmosphere. And the base idea in terms of this is that if you think about the gravitational in the simplest point of view, the uh, 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 simple point mass representation says that the gravitational attraction of a mass point on another mass point is uh, the constant, universal gravitational constant, times the mass of the attracting point times the di uh, divided by the distance squared to the point. And so that one over r squared factor. So there's a constant, the GM divided by the r squared. The GM for the attraction of the satellite on the first satellite is the same the difference and the range is different in terms of that. The one over R squared means that a given mass would attract the front satellite more strongly than it would attract the second satellite. So the consequence of that is the satellite leading satellite. That's assuming the satellites essentially are moving in this direction across the page. So this is the front satellite. This is a trailing satellite. This uh, front satellite would have a stronger traction, would have a greater acceleration. And as a consequence under the attraction at that particular point, it would separate from the, from the satellite, Accel separate and move away from it. As it moves past on the other side, that uh, attraction begins to slow it down. It's in the opposite direction. And so you get an acceleration that slows it down. And so you get a speed up in which the satellites separate as they're approaching it, because this one has a greater acceleration than this one. As they move by, the farther satellite essentially, uh, essentially has less attraction than the uh, uh, back satellite. So as a consequence, we get a, an attraction. Uh, after this one goes by, 
Wow, this one is on one side, the grace of uh, the training satellites on the other side. This one is accelerated forward. This one is being slowed down. So you get a very rapid closure and then you get this return back to the normality. And so this idea of looking at, uh, at this expansion uh, and traction for each one of the uh, mass points that the uh, satellites accumulate goes forward with it. The, uh, the idea is essentially to overfly all the points on the surface of the Earth and measure this response of the satellites, use that measurement and then inversion to come up with a model for the uh, mass displacement and effectively uh, repeat those measurements essentially on monthly type timeframes over the uh, over a, a sample period of roughly 30 days. And so each 30 days, we collect a series of these measurements, use those to come up with a model of the uh, satellite motion. Uh, the uh, satellite also uh, measures, uh, uses the accelerometer measurements to measure the neutral density. And there's some other measurements that goes out of it. But the fundamental measurement is this measurement of the expansion construction with the, uh, with the uh, micron level type of precision uh, in that displacement mode. Uh, to, to get an idea of what this looks like, uh, we'll note that this uh, black line shows the inner satellite range between the two satellites. This is on a scale of the uh, microns. And we note that it uh, has roughly uh, a character of roughly plus or minus 10 microns, peaking around the order of 100 type microns. And we note that plotted above this is the topography. This is for a satellite pass that goes over the Indian Ocean. Uh, goes on to the continent, passes over the Himalayas, and then goes back offshore in the uh, Arctic. And we can see that uh, the topography changes essentially uh, from uh, roughly a negative four kilometers below the Earth's surface to roughly four kilometers above it fairly abruptly as the uh, continental shelf is picked up uh, as this satellite flies over the, uh, the Indian satellite. And you can see this essential expansion contraction mode uh, shown here in response to this change in the mass, the large scale continental change in the mass. You see again, as the satellites fly over the Himalayas at this particular point here, the varying mass associated with the Himalayas and the various topography gives again the actual response, uh, expansion contraction in response to the mass distribution. Again, the expansion contraction as the satellites leave the, uh, the uh, continental shelf and go back over the Arctic Ocean. So it's this sort of measurement that one picks up and is used as the basis essentially for doing the inversion to come up with a gravity field. The, uh, apologize for whatever's happening here. This is really, I'm not sure what causes the jump in it, but I've got a problem with the computer here. Uh, the, uh, this essentially is the sort of thing that, uh, that is carried out over 30 days. You overfly the entire surface of the Earth and get these sort of measurements for each other's profiles. Uh, the, the history of that monthly repeat is shown here, and I'm running short on time, so I won't uh, go into that particular version in detail, but it says that we we're able, over the 15 year time frame of the GRACE mission, we were able to complete 163 monthly solutions, uh, solid representation in the mid portion of it between 2003 and 2010. In 2010, we began to have battery problems that forced us essentially to shut down the satellites when the satellite went into deep occultation to extend the mission. And we were able to get from 2010 up to 2017 with a uh, 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 not, 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 not optimal battery management mode. Uh, there's uh, some problem from the thermal characteristics in the data, but still very useful science data by getting those additional five years in this battery management mode. Uh, the sorts of things that one can do if we take that series of 15 monthly uh, solutions and create essentially a representation of the changes essentially from month to month in the actual mass uh, on the surface of the earth. And what we're showing here is uh, the uh, red are places where there's a mass deficiency. It would be a drought or could be a drought associated with mass deficiency. The blue signals are water excesses where there's been uh, water going into it. And you can see essentially some very interesting features showing into it. There are features going on on the mass distribution over the ocean, much smaller scale because the water on the changes on the land are uh, very strongly influenced by water leaving the ocean going to the land. There's a much smaller land area. And so to get an equivalent signal over the ocean, you get a much larger 
aer aerial representation to get the mass that goes to the land. And so the signals by and large are less intense over the ocean than they are over the land. We also see some that are sort of continuing changes from year to year. This represents the uh, loss of the polar ice sheets and represents some areas where there's a continual no uh, signal thing, but gains in the ice sheet over the poles. And so all of this information is the basis for a number of studies, applications looking at sea level change, uh, deep ocean currents, ocean heat storage, uh, polar and continental uh, ice sheet melt, a range of these phenomena, applications in terms of drought and flooding. And then uh, there's some uh, very interesting model assimilation results. And ep uh, looking at episodic events such as the earthquakes themselves show things that goes forward. These particular results, uh, you can actually go into a website shown here if you want to look at it. And there's a procedure in which you can actually go to a given particular point on the surface of the Earth, uh, come up effectively with a change for a given region in that particular point, and, uh, and do your own individual time studies uh, uh, to actually look at how these would look. We've shown this in a, in a in a quick look mode, if we want to go in and take a look at a region, what is actually looking at over the history of the change over the Grace mission, uh, we can plot that up and we'll look at that at a later slide. But if we look essentially at, at something that is a large scale features, look at the average over the ocean and we see essentially the uh, well, mass uh, change that's essentially uh, uh, on the land in the orange and the ocean mass change in the blue. We see the change leaving the ocean going to the land, leaving the land and going to the ocean that they're out of phase going forward on it. We note also that when we do a quick scan on this, if there is change in the in the uh, uh, um, amount of mass leaving on a, <clears throat> on a year to year basis, looking at something like decadal variability in your system operations. There's also, if we look at this carefully, there's an upward trend in the ocean, a downward trend in the land, suggesting that the ocean over this time frame is uh, is uh, is essentially uh, accumulating mass. The land over this time frame is essentially. Uh, losing uh, the mass variations. Question again comes into play. We see that we've separated into land and ocean. We see the change going forward in terms of that. Where on the ocean, where on the land is the bigger point. Uh, this uh, uh, sea level trend that we're looking at, uh, this uh, mass trend that we're looking at, is part essentially of an altimeter measured total global mass change. Uh, the, al uh, the measurement from this uh, three decades or more of, uh, of uh, uh, sea level measurements uh, started by TOPEX and still continued with the Jason altimeter series gives a very accurate uh, uh, representation of what the global ocean sea level would be. We know that that's uh, uh, made up of thermal expansion and added water. GRACE essentially measures the mass over the ocean, the added water. The thermal expansion is essentially uh, measured by a set of in situ measurements placed into the ocean that actually measures the upper portion of the heat temperature where most of the change in the thermal expansion is expected to occur. If we add these two components together, we get the sea level. The sea level could be measured directly, could be obtained by uh, taking the measured thermal expansion, the measured uh, added water from the grace measurements, add those together, and we get an agreement with it. This is important, and it allows us essentially to take any two of these and confirm the third. The closure of all three of those gives us confidence in the overall measurements. There could be system measurement is common to all of them that essentially would uh, be lost in that, but they're very different measurement modes. The height measurement, essentially simulated gravity measurements from inner satellite range measurements and an in-situ thermal measurement. And so to be able to put these together is an important representation in uh, being able to interpret the, the mean civil sea level change going forward. Uh, we're looking essentially at, again, at a global type representation. And the question is where in the ocean, uh, where in the ocean, and uh, where in the ocean the changes are occurring that go into this large scale global or over the ocean type representation and the signal we're looking at there. We can go in and look at these over the land areas. We indicated that if you go at a single point and look at the change over the entire uh, uh, mission, we show this signal as a trend that's averaged over the 15-year uh, type time frame, uh, 2002 to 2007. And in that particular point, uh, the, uh, the uh, continental ice sheets are losing uh, 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 
uh, melting and the water's going into the ocean. We see this again in the uh, West Antarctic ice sheet. We see it. Uh, uh, we see that uh, there's uh, places over the land where aquifers are being depleted uh, the, in terms of the uh, China and in terms of India, where there's a steady uh, loss of water over the time frame, leading to contributions to the ocean, but also leading to questions about the utilization of fresh water for drinking, agriculture, and other purposes in these areas where these aquifers are so important. Uh, we see major changes in uh, some of the uh, Middle Eastern areas going forward. And so one can go into the uh, to the actual record and look at the overall global trends in terms of a number of these uh, individual uh, uh, regional type activities, the California drought, Texas drought showing up. Uh, this is the sort of thing that I indicated. If you go to the website I mentioned before, you can actually bring this up and create these zone type representations any place that you'd have a question that you'd want to want to want to try to look at your own uh, interpretation of the results. Uh, the other point that goes forward on this is in the, uh, the utilization of the GRACE data, there's a concern essentially about essentially what GRACE is measuring. It measures the total water column and that GRACE signal over North America essentially comes out in a representation with large spatial scales and a total water column. Utilization is a lot of the uh, drought uh, concerns is essentially what the changes are in the surface moisture and more uh, significantly what's the changes in the groundwater, the deep water representation. Uh, by taking the uh, GRACE data, running into assimilation mode, one essentially has the ability to effectively get higher spatial resolution. There's a drought uh, monitor index. Uh, this shows it for 2014, but you can actually go on and look at the today's date on the drought monitor index. It shows you not only the prediction or the current drought characteristics, but also gives you a 30-day forecast going forward. So putting this in the model, it gives the ability to get higher spatial resolution, to do a predictive capability. But what's more important, it actually allows you to disaggregate effectively the, the total grace measurement into three components, the groundwater, the root zone soil moisture, and the surface soil moisture, which are important uh, components if you're looking at agriculture, it's important components if you're trying to look at uh, effectively uh, managing a groundwater resource going forward on it. So this particular representation which was put in place uh, and, it's, uh, and the results are actually generated by the, uh, and it doesn't show it here, but if you go to this particular point here, this is a product that's being done at the Goddard Space Flight Center and they're working with these results They've taken effectively the grace output that we've looked at here over the entire surface and have created essentially a, a, an assimilated product, uh, essentially looking at the sort of information that we showed just over the North American uh, continent of Mono Gobe, but show it over the uh, entire land surface area. Uh, so uh, that, uh, that point essentially shows the direction to where we would go. And this is the sort of representation that we think we would need to look at if we're trying to get into the uh, the uh, small set application. Coming back to the small set again, in that particular domain with that uh, particular measurement suite that's out there, both in the altimetry and in the gravity measurement mode, uh, where do we want to go with the uh, with the CubeSats? CubeSats in 2016 was looked at in a great deal of detail with the uh, uh, National Academy Space Studies Board study. And one of the points they pointed out is in the earth science, the multi-point high temporal uh, resolution of the Earth processes is of important. Uh, the uh, uh, satellite constellations uh, that can provide both global results and uh, diurnal observation processes vary throughout the day. The uh, temporal sampling modes are, are an important place that you can think about going. And those turn out to be things that are important in the uh, grace and in the, uh, in the uh, 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 altimetry related mode. GRACE has a 30 day replete, so you get results once every 30 days. The uh, altimeter, uh, TOPEX related altimeter basis is in a 10 day repeat. And so you get the essential sample at 10 day intervals going forward on that. And so the idea of trying to look at anything on the weekly or the diurnal scale is, uh, in, is can be done with the current configurations that we're working at. The question is, could we do anything by bringing in a measurement to complement those uh, high resolution measurements in the altimeter and the uh, and the uh, gravity measurement mode 
by using a, a capability of the small satellite mode. There are small satellite clusters that are up there. I won't spend much time on this. This may be a topic that uh, uh, next speaker will get into, but there is a cluster of eight satellites. The constellation mode in small satellites is important. And this uh, cluster of, uh, of uh, satellites essentially is trying to measure ocean uh, surface uh, uh, character winds and air sea interactions and tropical storms using uh, GPS measurements. It's on orbit, has been on orbit since 2016. There is a proposed uh, imaging related, uh, and this again, by the way, is a range, uh, has the potential for a ranging type application. It isn't used that way in this measurement, but the reflecting type measurement is one that uh, could, could be uh, thought about in that mode. The actual uh, tropics is the proposed imaging uh, characteristics in when a a cluster of six satellites would overfly again weather related activities and look at those characteristics. This is scheduled, it says 20, uh, 20 here. I think it's actually now slipped to 2021 uh, to be launched going forward on it. So this is a NASA uh, uh, activity that's working with uh, MIT uh, led PI and a uh, uh, activity working with, last, uh, with the NASA to actually put this tropics on orbit. This is a small set bird. This is a micro set, kind of a mid satellite uh, mode, but this one actually shows something in the small set plan version. Um, the uh, resolution for the time it is kind of shown here, it overflies and comes up with uh, essentially a detailed uh, look at the precipitation and the winds that's going forward on this. Uh, uh, see, I'm in the actual running mode. I'll run through this. Let me make two quick comments and then I'll stop this, Patrick. I'm sorry I'm running along here. Uh, the two things that we've looked at essentially under the uh, Portugal program is essentially a look at building a small satellite mode, a single satellite as a first step in looking at the clusters of satellites. And the plan on this would be to try to come up with something that resembles the capability, emulates the capability of CHAMP. CHAMP was a mission that preceded GRACE. It had magnetics and gravity as a measurement concept mode. And so that proof of concept would allow us to put it on orbit. And we want to look at trying to use this to monitor the Earth's gravity field and to measure the atmospheric density. And there's some goals that are that are not in the GRACE domain, but provide important long wave information that would supplement the GRACE mode if we can do this version. Uh, the important point on this is it's, uh, it's prototyped as a 6U cube set. And one of the big things is to try and actually build an accelerometer that actually could go into this uh, the, the uh, microset or the CubeSat type mode. Uh, the accelerometer we know is an important component of the GRACE mission. And so the objective of doing the accelerometer is important. Uh, uh, accurate uh, star tracker to actually allow us to keep the attitude orientation and bring in a GPS receiver. These three components, the accelerometer, the uh, star tracker, and the GPS receiver were central elements of the CHAMP gravity measurement component. So if we can get comparable type performance in a CubeSat version of this, then we'd be at a point to do a single satellite type recovery. By being able to put up clusters of these in a cheap mode, easy to launch mode, we would be able to actually improve on the single satellite capability, we would go forward. And so this would be essentially the objectives of this one particular version. The other version is to look essentially at the altimeter, to try to come up with uh, a microset version of the altimeter, a small set version of the altimeter, to try to look at interleaving and doing inter and improving on the temporal coverage, bring information that could support the uh, standard satellite version. There's also a detailed uh, study in terms of the other version of essentially looking at the data uh, versions coming out of the gravity data and the altimeter data in a means of studying these for looking at oceanographic and land service properties going forward on that. And I apologize for running over. I'll uh, stop at that point and uh, turn it back to you then, uh, Patrick. Um, well, thank you. No, that's fine. Uh, thank you so much for a um, wonderful overview um, of, the, of the remote sensing of the Earth system. And it's clear that you very nicely showed the coupled nature of all of the different components and we are, we are achieving such accuracy that any of the other components now matters in measuring one of them. But with that, um, since it's a masterclass, I really would like to encourage um, questions from the audience, from our participants. So um, if you have questions, either raise your hand, uh, type your questions into the chat box, um, sorry, no, in the chat, the Q&A box. And maybe while people, um, 
you know type or or think about questions uh, maybe i can i can start it off and yeah um you the, you showed towards the end especially the the idea is of see whether we can miniaturize um some of these really backbone missions like altimetry and and gravimetry um the, into small sets do you foresee that these might be able to replace the um, current satellites in terms of um continuing a climate record with the required accuracy that sort of is is demanded to to have a long-term uh, accurate um, measurements uh, you know Pat, that's a, a very you know meaningful topic question right now uh it would be dangerous to say that one could pick up the climate records of either with what we have the capabilities that have been displayed at the present time with the small set mode uh, from the point of view right now, I would say it's a niche market. If we look at things that can't be done with the conventional satellite modes and the records that we have going forward and try to do value added for those, the path for what one would want to do, there's some very obvious important points that could be contributed to, uh, if take GRACE for instance, this issue of trying to improve the spatial temporal resolution, we can't do very much on that with a single pair. This, the pair is very important. Uh, if you take one of the satellites away and take a very accurate three component, you lose a great deal of the resolution ability. That dual satellite mode really brings a lot of the uh, of the accuracy, sensing accuracy that isn't there in a single satellite mode. And so you lose roughly an order of magnitude or maybe more in the gravity field measurement at the important uh, uh, wavelengths that we're looking at in the gravity field measurement if you try doing this with a single satellite. But the time variability of that particular information is very important in interpreting and understanding what this 30-day sample that GRACE has if you try to extend that back down to something at shorter time scale. So there's a role to play there. To be able to replace something like GRACE requires that we build the two satellite capability in a microsat mode. We're working on two of the three components in this particular study, the accelerometer, the GPS, and the um, star tracker. The inter-satellite range measurement still would need to be developed, and that micron level ranging in that particular mode, that again raises a, a challenge that's an order of magnitude above that. It's also uh, uh, the, the idea of essentially what the actual ability to create the information in the microset environment, that hasn't been essentially validated yet. The metric measurement is difficult. In principle, you'd think if you know all of those three components, attitude, uh, uh, the tracking range going out of it, you should be able to, uh, to you know, come up with a comparable measurement. That still needs to be developed. So that dodges the issue going out of it. So I would say right now that I would not propose to replace GRACE with a microset. I would propose to actually do everything we can to improve the capabilities of the microset in the niche places where it can contribute now, look for those places and look for the idea of trying to be able to deal, uh, develop the capability in a dual satellite mode. It's wonderful to think about what you could have if you had a cluster of the dual satellite measurements up there, the sort of things that we could get out of it. Same thing would apply in the altimeter. There's fundamental limitations on the altimeter. The big issue there is generating enough power to send the signal to the surface and then have an antenna large enough to measure it accurately when it returns. So there's real uh, scaling effects that have to be looked at to duplicate the uh, characteristics of the centers on orbit now. Great. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so one more question. Uh, is there any more questions from the attendees? So remember, this is a master class, so you'll get extra credits for um, participation and asking questions. So please do not be shy. There are no bad questions if you if you have any. Um, anyone like to ask another question? Okay, well, I, I can I can ask one more. We were a bit over time, but I think one more question. I, I, I for example, we there's this interesting. Well, it's not a tension, but uh, of course the the power of satellites is to be global scale, and we can do global uh, address global scale problems on the regional scale um, between Portugal and the Azores. Um, it's an interesting. So the the entire sort of regional scale basin. Um, this could be a really nice study area for you know looking at you know high resolution processes and also high frequency processes and of course for the high frequencies you need higher orbit repeats um, and coastal processes both um, you know as you go to the 
Portuguese coast, the 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 Azores archipelago, and there's there's an there's an idea to actually equip um, phone cables uh, with um, with bottom pressure sensors, um, with and and in fact having a cable that that connects the the um, Portugal with the Azores. Uh, do you, would that be a, a good addition to either calibrating and and still improving the understanding of the satellite signals? I think that'd be really a really not only important but a really exciting type aspect to add into it. It's a place where we need a lot more of this actual uh, type in situ type measurements to fully understand the uh, <clears throat> the uh, the satellite measurements. The ocean bottom pressure. We have a series of uh, bottom pressure gauges around places where they're mostly in the uh, in the uh, uh, western boundary current type regions, a large, large number of those in places where it's not representative of the total ocean. Uh, there are places where the uh, the inference of the bottom pressure gauge from the gravity agrees very well with the bottom pressure gauges, but there's so much more to think about in that particular domain. And that region that you just mentioned is extremely interesting, not only from the oceanographic point of view, ocean mass related, it's also a major interest in the uh, gravity point of view, the uh, continental physics, the hotspot region in there. And so in terms of coming up with instrumentation where one could actually uh, study the actual uh, or work with validating and understanding the measurements made by the existing altimeters and the existing gravity fields would really be an important point to do so. If there were interest in doing that, I would be highly encouraging and going forward with it. Great. Okay, well, thank you very much uh, again for this wonderful uh, overview. Um, and I see we we have, uh, um, yeah, um, Dr. Larson is, is also online. We, we, ha we have a scheduled uh, break now. This, the, the break was scheduled to be until um, uh, 10.05 central time. I would say maybe because we ran just a little bit over time, if we reconvene at um, uh, 10 past, um, that would give us um, almost 15 minutes of a break, which is what's scheduled. I hope that is okay with everyone. Okay, great. Um, yeah, and uh, so we'll, we'll reconvene and then we'll have, um, uh, and Dr. Larson um, with the with the next presentation. Okay. <clears throat> um, let me see. Should I maybe pause the recording during this time? I will. Okay. So we're recording and. <clears throat> oh, that's why it said I couldn't do that because you. There we go. Okay. Um, it does say I'm unable to start video, but maybe that'll come back. I couldn't. Oh, uh, I couldn't start my video for a while too either. So I don't know whether that's. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's okay. Do you want me to share yeah. a screen? Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Okay. Please, please. Okay, go ahead. I'll mm -hmm. try to share a screen. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll say share. And there it is. Yep. And, uh, you can see it well. I will. Is it okay if I start it? Uh, no, I'm. I'm gonna just um, um, make an introduction. Um, oh no, so... no. I mean, is it okay oh. if I click the slideshow button? Oh yes, yes, yes. Wait? Please, please do. Yes, please do. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm gonna click. Is that okay? Can you see it? Yes, yes, we can okay. see it very well in full screen mode. And so, um, yeah. So, uh, welcome back, everyone. And um, it's a real pleasure to welcome Dr. Christine Larson, a geodesist and professor emerita in aerospace engineering sciences from the University of Colorado uh, in Boulder. And so Dr. Larson is known worldwide for developing innovative ways to use GPS signals to study the Earth. And so we're moving into a different um, measurement uh, arena. She has conducted groundbreaking research in the area of high precision GPS applications. Uh, in particular, she and her group made the first application of GPS techniques to study plate boundary deformation, global plate tectonic motions, uh, glacial isostatic adjustment, uh, she pioneered the use of GPS data for measuring seismic displacements, the use for finite fault slip models and ice sheet motions. And then she and her group have also developed GPS interferometric reflectometry that enables measurement of near surface soil moisture, snow depth, vegetation, water content, and permafrost melt and water levels. Among Dr. Larson's services and awards are just recently this year, as I understand it, the election to the National Academy of Sciences. So congratulations. It's, Thank it's you. A very, uh, and um, she's been a Fulbright Research Scholar, Humboldt uh, Foundation Research Prize. In 2015, she um, earned, won the EGU Christian Huygens Medal. She's an elected fellow of the AGU, 
2007 um, AGU barrel lecture uh, that she gave, and then in uh, 2006, uh, the, the uh, Japan Society for Promotion of Science Award from the University of Tokyo, Tokyo just among some of her, her services and awards. And Dr. Larsen has been a member of a number of National Research Council studies. So it's a very important um, uh, it's a mechanism here in the US for, for developing a national level uh, science. Um, and the most recent one is the evolving the geodetic infrastructure to meet new scientific needs. And um, yeah, Dr. Larsen earned a PhD from the Scripps Institution of Oceanography in UC San Diego. And today, Dr. Larsen will speak about GPS reflectometry to study the Earth. So please, Dr. Larsen, the screen is yours. OK. Uh, try to let me know if things aren't coming through or my voice can't be heard. Um, I'm just going to give you a, a view of where I'm going with this talk. Uh, I'm going to talk about geodesy. Uh, Byron set that up by talking about gravity. I'm going to talk uh, mostly about how GPS revolutionized geodesy. Uh, before I go into these new applications that me and that I and my colleagues have developed over the last, oh, I don't know, 30 years or so. And I'll finish up talking about the future for GPS and GNSS. So uh, I have to start with the definition of geodesy from the dictionary, where you talk about basically measuring the size, shape, and gravity field of the Earth. Now, I'm only going to talk about the size and shape. Uh, but I would tell you that if, instead of that kind of vague thing, big thing, size and shape, just think about geodesy as the science of measuring where you are. So measuring your latitude, longitude, and height. Um, those of us who uh, do this for science tend to think in a Cartesian world. So we usually talk about our x, y, z coordinates, where x is Greenwich and z is the pole. But it's the same thing, measuring where you are. So uh, I like to start a little bit at the beginnings, and I'm calling this the modern first modern advance in geodesy. Um, I mean, it's pretty cool to think that in you know the early 17th century, uh, Snell proposed a measurement system that continued to be used for um, over 300 years. And his idea was basic, to use basic trigonometry and some surveying tools to make the measurement to make maps. And what's shown on the right is a map of Holland. The triangles are the vertices of measurements that were made to make that map. And what they did was they would measure a baseline. So I put that in quotes. They would measure this distance between, say, two church steeples, if you will, very precisely. Then they'd put some kind of beacon up here at the top of my triangle, and they'd measure angles. They'd measure this angle on the left, and they'd measure this angle on the right, and go back and think about law of signs. If you know one side and two angles, you can get the other two sides, then you kind of leapfrog. And if you know the latitude, longitude, and height of one of your vertices, or in this case, two of your vertices, you can leapfrog from one part of Holland to the other, by just making more and more triangle, me triangle measurements. Now you'll see here this 50 kilometers, it's telling you this is not a measurement from space. This is a ground-based measurement. You have to be able to see from one vertice of the triangle to the other. But there were early geoscience applications of geodesy. Professor Tapley has talked about satellite geodesy being used to study the earth. Um, this is also a long-term um, interest of, of people that use geodesy to study how the Earth deforms from earthquakes. Uh, this happens to be an example of the 1906 San Francisco earthquake. Uh, in, in red here, you can see the 1906 rupture was hundreds of kilometers long. And this was a, um, a, like a horizontal rupture, which means that the ground mostly moved laterally. It didn't go up and down so much. But it was big. It was huge, in fact. And I, I like to put this famous photograph in my presentation to just give people a, you know, a feel for how the ground was ripped apart by this earthquake. And this displacement of the fence shows you that within a space of a minute or so, the ground was permanently deformed by this uh, earthquake, which shows by this 
fence displacement. Now, what's this have to do with Snell and triangulation and um, a technique that was developed in or proposed in 1617? Well, it turns out a very famous uh, American geodesy group uh, at the US Coast and Geodetic Survey had made triangle measurements. Looks just like that map of Holland, the Netherlands. They would me made measurements before 1906. They went back out after 1906. And then they came up with models that would help them understand how would those triangles be distorted by that very large earthquake. Now you see the rupture, in fact, is this gray line here, or part of it. So it wasn't going right through the angles, but it would still distort those triangles. And what's shown to the right is actually, uh, 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 you know, telling you that not every single triangle could be repeated. Um, you can see that there were many more after 1906 than before. And I would just point out that this um, reference I'm showing here is fairly recent within the last 20 years. So people are still using those triangle measurements um, to this day. So the other thing that geodesy, when you uh, talk to people what, what geodesy does for earth science is it's given us a way to measure what people used to call continental drift. And this theory that Wegener proposed that sort of looked at geologic data that said, look, South America looks like it used to be connected to Africa and we have fossils and there's geologic data that suggests we used to have a large continent that had spread apart. But it was only when you had a theory, really, a plate tectonic theory, that you had something that geodesy could come and say, look, we're gonna test this theory. And I don't know if you've seen this kind of cartoon before, but the different colors are the different tectonic plates. And in plate tectonic theory, these plates are supposed to be internally rigid. And all the deformation is supposed to happen on the plate boundaries. And these red arrows are telling you the kind of deformation that's happening on the, the boundaries. And so you can see in California where that 1906 earthquake is, those arrows, sorry, those arrows are showing you that horizontal motion that they were sliding past each other. Whereas in Japan, there's a compression. And here at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, there's an extension. So I try, when I talk to people, I try to say that, you know, plate tectonics is basically a three-dimensional spherical jigsaw puzzle. It's a zero-sum game. If crust is being formed here, it's being removed here and it's sliding at these transform boundaries. But you can see the problem with using triangles to try and measure this plate tectonic theory. It's simply impossible. You, you know, the, the measurements that were made in the Netherlands were 30, 40 kilometers apart. We simply have no way to measure the deformation between North America and Europe unless we come up with a different technology. And you have to stop requiring visibility to your other measurement site. And this is where GPS has revolutionized things is instead of looking at where you're measuring to, everybody agrees to look at the same satellites. So in GPS, the distance between the two sites doesn't matter. What matters is that you're able to track the same satellite signals. So, <clears throat> excuse me, this is my one cartoon of um, what I'm gonna call a GPS measurement site. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that I'm using the exact same system you're using in your phone and in your car, uh, but I'm spending about, uh, let me see, a thousand times more on how much my instrument costs than in your phone. So let's say the GPS receiver in your phone costs $5. Uh, mine costs about 10 to $15,000. And in fact, it's expensive and I wanna have a really stable instrument. So I'm gonna have this antenna separate from the receiver, which is usually in an equipment box down here on the ground, but we're still doing the same thing. We're tracking satellite signals and um, we're using those satellite signals to compute latitude, longitude, and height, or, you know, if you want to say X, Y, and Z, that's fine, but we're all doing the same thing. We're listening, if you will, to GPS signals. So I'm going to give you an example from the Netherlands. Um, a very long-term measurement uh, series 
Uh, this is what uh, GPS antenna costs, excuse me, this is what a GPS antenna looks like if you spend $3,000. Um, the price of that has not come down in my career, basically. Uh, this is the location. And this is an example of what um, we do with GPS if we're trying to measure plate tectonics. Um, we install a state-of-the-art instrument with a very precise antenna, and then we leave it alone, and then we measure where that place in the Netherlands is every single day. So the blue measurements, which start in about 1994, are the daily points for that location. This actually is only goes through 2012, but it's since been updated. I'm only showing you the horizontal motions. So here's the north component where I've, I've, I've shown you that this is a 30 centimeter scale for latitude. So north, south and longitude, east, west. So I'm showing you that this particular part of Europe is going east and north. And I can calculate how fast it's going by fitting to that curve, 1.78 centimeters a year, 1.56 centimeters per year. It looks very linear, and that's what plate tectonics says it should be. Rigid doesn't mean it doesn't move. It means that it moves linearly, and it only changes its velocity at those boundaries. And you can see the other thing about GPS is it's such a precise measurement technique is such a precise geodetic measure te measurement technique that this line here is telling you when they change the antenna. It can detect when there is a flaw in the antenna at the several millimeter level. So that's what causes that. Uh, this is what, what we would call the GPS velocity field looks like. So what people have done is they've tracked GPS satellites for decades from thousands of stations on the surface of the earth. And then they fit lines to those that are in the interiors of plates. They've taken into account those small antenna problems. And you can see, sure enough, here in Holland, things are going to the Northeast. Here in North America, things are, they appear to be rotating counterclockwise. The length of the vector is defined down here. And that tells you how fast the plate is going. So the North American plate is rotating counterclockwise. The Eurasian plate is rotating clockwise. If you combine those two motions, sure enough, you create crust at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. But it also tells you things like the Pacific plate is a fat, fa excuse me, a fast plate and things like that. So um, I started graduate school in the late 1980s. There were some, um, uh, there were some uh, space geodesy techniques that were just being uh, brought to fruition that started to make these measurements. Uh, GPS has come in and basically made it possible to do this anywhere, any place, any time, so that we have these very precise uh, measurements. We also have precise measurements at the plate boundaries. Now we can't easily describe those with a single vector, this happens to be the velocity field for Japan for only about a third of their sites. I simply couldn't plot them all because it became too cluttered. Uh, here's the scale bar. Uh, this was in between great earthquakes. Uh, plate boundaries are extremely complicated. And in this particular case, it's complicated because these gray lines here are the plate boundaries. And when you have four plates, you have a complicated deformation field. So another thing GPS has revolutionized is the ability to measure the motion um, caused by the earthquake. So basically a before and after, if you think back to that fence from the 1906 earthquake, uh, how, how much did the fence move? And, and, and possibly being able to do that any place you had a GPS receiver. Uh, this happens to be a, a magnitude eight earthquake in Japan. 65 centimeters of permanent deformation. That's, you know, a small earthquake uh, uh, in Japan. Um, and this brings me to kind of a place where I was, um, you know, I, I, I was making maps like this, where in this case, each blue dot was the location of the station before the earthquake and then after the earthquake. I'd also done some initial plate tectonic theories 
initially plate tectonic studies, but I was looking for something new to do. And um, this brings to me to the two kinds of geodesy, people that use geodetic science and, and Professor Tapley brought up some of those, people that are studying snow loading, people that are looking at the oceans um, to try and understand those physical parts of the earth. Um, for earthquakes, it's studying the strength of the earth. But there's also geodetic engineering where people are trying to make better measurements. And for the last two decades of my career, I've been working on geodetic engineering. So improving GPS measurement and developing new applications. And that's what I'm gonna talk about here. So the question my group looked at was, what can GPS tell us about what happened during the earthquake? Okay, traditional geodesy just does a before and after. It tells you nothing about what happened during the earthquake. Um, why do this with GPS? Well, seismometers basically uh, saturate during large earthquakes. If you're right on top of an earthquake, it just basically clips. So a GPS seismometer could inexpensively supplement those networks, which don't work very well during large earthquakes. When we looked at what was happening, now, okay, think back. I had a time series where I showed you almost two decades of measurements. Then I was showing you about a year of measurements. Now I'm showing you 100 seconds. Okay, so very different time scale. So now each one of these points is an independent measurement of where the ground was. So instead of just doing the before and the after, now I can tell you something about how that seismic energy ruptured through the earth. Uh, this is actually, that was a magnitude eight earthquake. This is what the ground did during a magnitude nine earthquake, the great Tohoku earthquake. Um, that's why that magnitude eight is considered small. Here we look at something that moved the earth permanently over five meters, you know, during a hundred seconds and caused huge uh, tsunamis, death, destruction, horrible, horrible earthquake. Um, and GPS measured this in all three dimensions. Um, and this is because the geodetic network of Japan um, was installed to do geodesy and, and um, surveying. Um, I'll show you a video of what that looked like on a, on a bigger scale. I'm not gonna show all the stations because there's just so many of them, but basically just wanna remind you the scale bar is right here. So this is a meter and this is horizontal on the left and vertical on the right. And so the scale bar is down here. And you're gonna see those little vectors moving every second, I hope. Yeah, and there'll be a star showing up, which is when the earthquake began. But it takes a little while, earthquake begins, takes a little while for that rupture to arrive on Honshu. Now you're seeing this huge um, oscillation caused by that seismic energy. You're seeing the up and down motions as well as the horizontal motions. One of the big points of GPS is it measures both the dynamic motions and the permanent motions. Now it's gonna do kind of a funny thing because there was an aftershock, okay? There's another red star there. So this is an aftershock of magnitude eight, which again is visible. Um, GPS is pretty much the only instrument that's gonna give you that kind of temporal and spatial resolution. All right, so. So let's go back to the GPS data. Um, I don't think I'm telling you anything you don't know, but you can make your results look almost perfect by extending the y-axis. So it almost looks like I can perfectly measure the absence of motion and then it takes off at about 100 seconds, but that's because the y-axis is nine meters from peak to tail. If I look at things close up, so let's say I'm just gonna I'm just going to zoom in here before the earthquake. It doesn't look like I can do it perfectly anymore, because remember, this is before the earthquake. The y-axis now is plus or minus three centimeters. And now I'm showing you 120 minutes. So you either have to come up with a theory for why the Earth appears to be oscillating over this two-hour period, 
with a peak of two centimeters, or you have to accept that there's noise, there's some unmodeled error source that's causing these oscillations, which have, you know, five to 10 minute period. Um, it's an error source. It's a GPS error source we know about, but which it usually goes away, or we ignore it because we can average over days, hours. It's caused by oscillations from GPS signals that bounce on the surface of the Earth below the antenna. So here I'm showing that same cartoon from before. It's the same antenna, but there's also a signal that will bounce off the surface and arrive at the antenna late. And this is called multipath. I'll, I'll call it GPS reflections. It's an error source we know about, but it's not an error source we're able to deal with very well. Um, for the GPS seismology problem, we have a pretty good way of making the error source go away by taking advantage of our knowledge of orbital mechanics, basically. We know the GPS satellite orbit so well, and we know that it's just shy of a 24 hour twice per rev um, signature there, that if we just look at Monday, we can subtract it from Tuesday to make those reflections go away. I, I, it, I, since I can't see anybody's face, I, I don't know if people are believing me, but basically you make an empirical mapping of what the ground reflection looks like on Monday. Then if the earthquake occurs on Tuesday, you subtract Monday from Tuesday and you're done. What's left over is just the earthquake. So when we were working on GPS seismology, uh, we, we worked on further developing this technique, which was proposed by some investigators at Scripps, gee, I don't know, in the 1990s. Um, but it was at the same time, uh, just observing these reflected signal effects or multipath effects gave us an idea for a new way to use GPS. Those oscillations are caused by ground reflections, but that should vary depending on whether the ground has snow on it, whether it has dead vegetation as it would in October, or uh, green or wet vegetation in, in June. This happens to be a site in the uh, Western US where you have all of these signals. And after all, it's, it's just like a radar. And the radar people talk about this all the time. We could use GPS as essentially an in-situ radar. So why, who would wanna know these things? Well, plenty of people, climate scientists, the same kinds of people that Professor Tapley was talking about, um, people that wanna know how much snow is on the ground, climate scientists, hydrologists, you could do this just for farmers and they would be happy about it. Uh, soil moisture data, how wet the soil is, is important for weather forecasting. Um, Eco-scientists want to understand how vegetation is changing uh, in the current climate. Why would you measure this with GPS? The same question we asked, why would you want to measure seismic waves with GPS? Well, it would supplement other sensors, all of which have trade-offs. Um, when I started, uh, people were talking about using soil moisture satellites that had footprints of 40 kilometers by 40 kilometers. That's pretty big for people that want to study uh, much smaller uh, scales. Uh, the in-situ sensors had footprints of 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters. So it's nice to have something in the middle. A GPS soil moisture sensor or snow depth sensor could be inexpensive. So I started working with data from a US initiative it was not an environmental network. It was meant to study the plate boundary. I started off this talk by talking about a great earthquake that occurred here in the San Francisco Bay Area. You can see why these red dots are where the GPS receivers were located. And you can see we're still studying this plate boundary. That's where the bulk of the stations were. But we also had deformation signals we were studying in Nevada and Utah, these states, and the Pacific Northwest as well as Alaska. So this uh, network was installed, I think, starting in 2006. Uh, we turned it into a snow network. Each one of these symbols indicates a place we were able, able to measure snow depth over about over um, 220 sites in all. 
Um, we had to prove to people that we were measuring the right answer. Uh, one of our validations was by taking a photograph of this pole every day. And so as the snow level goes up, we can digitize that photograph to give us an ins uh, a, a comparison point. Um, I'm also going to show you that we took those photographs and, and juxtaposed them with um, the plot, just so you'd have something that visually to look at. So let me try this. Yeah. What's down below is me, the GPS analyst, measuring snow depth. What's shown on top are the photos that we actually use to digitize. And I encourage any of you that want to validate your measurement techniques to take photographs, because I had no idea how cloudy it was until I actually did this experiment. So then the question becomes, how well this plot on the bottom is what I say the snow depth was based on the GPS reflections. Red is the camera. And remember, the camera is just a pole, one pole. The blue is based on an average, basically, of the field. So there's good, good agreement. It got the right ups and downs, has the right scale. Once you have an idea, we had this idea and we were funded to do this starting in 2011. We did this through the lifetime of the project through the end of 2018, but you can retroactively apply it to data that were in the archives. You have a climate scale, climate time scale record now for 220 sites. Uh, we also measured soil moisture. Uh, this happens to be a site in southern, uh, southeastern New Mexico. Um, we don't measure directly water. This was a MET sensor that measured precipitation. We had models of precipitation. We basically display them here as a reality check that in fact, when it rains, GPS measured soil moisture increasing, and then the soil dried, rained again, GPS soil moisture went up, dried, so these are called dry downs. So the hydrologists use these to see how fast it dries down. Of course, they're gonna use these with records for temperature as well, so that they better understand that water cycle. We also measured a, veg a vegetation water content um, parameter, which shown on the top is our vegetation product, which basically shows you vegetation water content going up. Then when the uh, vegetation starts to die, it goes down. This is a double peak where the vegetation starts to grow, then basically it doesn't rain for a long time. The vegetation starts to die, then it rained, grows again, gets a second growth spurt and so on. What's unique about this is basically it's directly related to water content, not vegetation color, and it's daily and it's over a smaller scale than most other uh, measurements. So this happens to be in Wyoming, if you know where that is. Um, because, uh, basically because the San Andreas Fault is in California, we had a large network in California that I could use to study vegetation changes. This happens to be a nine year record where we compare, basically blue is normal vegetation, Red means it's in drought. Uh, darker blue means it's a very wet year. They got a lot of snow. They got a lot of rain. Um, we have so many droughts in California now, it's not as, uh, uh, it's hard to know which one to pick out. But this was a drastic three-year drought, 2012 through 2014. That clearly shows you the regional nature of that drought. It wasn't all of California. And it also shows you that there was a very big drought in 2007, but it was one year. It did not last for three years. Um, after we started our network to study snow and soil moisture and vegetation, I was visiting a group in Sweden who suggested we try uh, measuring water levels. So again, why would you want to measure water level with GPS, GPS reflections? Well, a couple reasons. One is um, some of the slides that Professor Tapley was showing you are really most useful if you know exactly where sea level is uh, with respect to the center of the earth. Uh, most tight gauges will know. All tight gauges measure relative sea level. They don't measure absolute sea level. 
So it would be good if you had a tide gauge that actually was in the same system that Professor Tapley is using. Uh, my PhD advisor told me that a tide gauge that has no parts in salt water is always a useful thing. And then it's also relatively inexpensive. Uh, this is a, a GPS site in Alaska run by a colleague of mine. Uh, he installed it to measure post seismic deformation. Uh, but my colleagues and I turned it into a tide gauge. What's shown in magenta is a tide gauge that's about 30 kilometers away. What's shown in blue is our retrievals for water levels using exactly the same data that my colleague is using to measure uh, post seismic deformation. So this particular site has very large tides of almost eight meters. Uh, GPS signals can also contribute to our uh, measurements in the polar regions. Professor Tapley showed you how Grace is providing information on that question. Um, this was work I did with the late John Moore, where we took advantage of these GPS sites that were installed in Greenland, primarily, well, entirely to measure the motion of the ice sheets. Just notice this plywood here that's flush with the snow. Uh, the pole itself was about three meters tall. In two, by 2012, it was installed in 2011. By 2012, you see there was huge melt out the biggest melt out they'd ever seen in modern times in Greenland. And then over the years, uh, my colleagues took photos and then I just put them all together so you could see that in fact, yes, large snow accumulation rates at this location in Greenland. This is what my record looks like from the GPS reflection measurements. This is this big melt out in 2012 and you can see how drastic it was compared to the very slow accumulation over the last seven years. Usually the melt out is in the summer and it's quite small. So um, I want to talk a little bit about the future for GPS before uh, finishing up. Um, pretty exciting for me is that people are now installing GPS to do reflectometry and purpose. So Pretty much everything else I've shown you was based on me taking advantage of people that installed GPS receivers for something else. And because in the US there's a requirement that data collected with public tax money is publicly archived, you know, I could access it, but it was never installed for me. Let's put it that way. These three GPS antennas, one of which is on a 30 meter tower, were installed for snow accumulation studies. This uh, site was installed by the Alaska Ocean Observing System to measure tides uh, in a region where they have difficulty measuring tides. Think about where tide gauges are. They're usually on piers. <clears throat> they have huge permafrost melt problems in Alaska. They have erosion problems. Here's a tide gauge where you don't have to build anything. You don't have to build a, you don't have to build a house for it. Well, there is a little tiny little house, but um, you can be a bit far off from the, um, from the coast. You don't have to be right directly on the coast because you don't have any parts in the water. Um, and you get, a, unlike my previous slide where we had, we had points whenever there was a reflected signal, now with using signals from the European system, the Russian system, the American system, and the Chinese system, you basically have measurements every five minutes, just like a normal tide gauge. So I'm gonna circle back. Uh, whatever happened to GPS seismology, I'm really excited about this. This is not my work, but when I was working on this problem, we were just happy to show that GPS could be a substitute seismometer. Uh, the group, so this happens to be at the University of Washington, but these people are actually taking and putting it into public warning systems, earthquake early warning. They're using the high rate GPS measurements to give people time to get to a safe space um, by the time the waves arrive. Remember when I showed you that Japanese video, the waves don't arrive instantaneously. If you can, if you can excuse me, if you can warn people, they can get safe. Um, another group, this is at the US Geological Survey, they did a really clever thing where they use the GPS in your phone. It's not as good as that $10,000 instrument I use, 
But as Professor Tapley was pointing out, you know, you can do a lot of things with cheap sensors if you've got a lot of them. So um, I think the answer is yes, but you need people to download an app and put it on their phone. And I think we all know young people will do that. So you have a possibility for that. Um, and then I think I have like two more slides of things I've been doing recently. Um, I don't know if you all have been following the news about Hurricane Laura. This was in uh, um, primarily hit Louisiana and Eastern Texas. Um, I knew that there was a GPS antenna on this NOAA Sentinel. It's on a tide, there's a tide gauge on this Sentinel as well. And when I saw where the hurricane was going, uh, I decided to see if I could measure water level during the hurricane. So what's shown here in red is wind speed. And these are in meters per second. So these are up to 40 meters per second wind speeds. It turns out the GPS receiver is at this star and as the eye of the hurricane crossed right over this GPS site. It lost no data. The blue dots are the GPS measurements of water level. It's not as good as the NOAA tide gauge, which is in blue, but it worked. And it actually caught the storm surge peak because as that eye crossed over, the wind speed went back to down to zero, basically, before coming back up. So up to about, well, that's ridiculous. That says it got a point at 60 meters per second. But reliably, it got measurements up to 40 meters per second. And the reason it got this one up at the top is because the wind speed was so small. So not only is it a normal tide gauge, this is a, this is a tide gauge that can be used during storm surges. Um, the other thing I've been working on is uh, making these resources more widely available. Um, when you talk to most people, it can be quite daunting to have them install your code and get it working. Um, I sympathize with that. Um, we don't install code when we want to order groceries, or we don't install code when we want to, you know, order an Uber. We use an app. So uh, I made this web app that does reflectometry on demand. So imagine you click a little button, and this is like your little grocery cart, and you hit submit, and it gives you the answers. At least that's my theory. So I want to end with what Giannis Geodesis, what we hope GPS would do. Um, well, I, I have to admit, I never knew there would be a thousand GPS receivers in the Western US, but these vectors are the Western US from that initiative I talked to you about. Um, we were really hoping we could do this global plate tectonic model. But along the way, uh, we developed ways to measure seismic waves, snow depth, sea level, Ice, ice and snow accumulation, vegetation, water content, and soil moisture. And I will stop there. Should I say stop sharing or what should I do? Um, thank you. Uh, no, no, just, just leave it at that and okay. we have time for discussion. Um, yeah, thank you very much for a wonderful talk. Maybe um, I ask uh, Luisa Bastos, would you like to um, take on this moderation of Q&A? Um, where I, I can I can continue as I'm again I'm yeah yeah yes. okay thank, yeah please thank you very much uh, Christina for this uh, uh, nice uh, presentation and uh, um, I would like to to give the the time for the participants to to put to put questions first there is one in the Q and A box there is one uh, question here. Um, what is your opinion on GNSS reflectometry from satellites, in particular using small satellites? Um, from Andre Guerra. Uh, so basically, that's what you should do. I mean, if you have the money to launch uh, GNSS receivers in space, you should do it. Absolutely. You get a better spatial sampling. Um, the more you can launch, the better temporal sampling you'll have. There's some beautiful results from Cygnus. 
but Cygnus was using expensive satellites or relatively expensive. I guess they, were, they would be considered small sats. Um, I don't see any reason why you can't do that from a CubeSat. And that's what people should do. You're gonna have restrictions uh, based on smoothness of the surface, but I absolutely am a fan of doing this from space. I'm just taking advantage of existing infrastructure and maybe in some ways, um, it's, it's just an in situ measurement that we'll eventually just rely on. But the space stuff I think is really exciting. Um, looking at uh, snow water equivalent will be very cool with GPS. Soil moisture results from space look very good. So yeah, I, that's the future. That's not my future. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think that's something that universities can play a role because once the satellites get small enough, people can um, more, there are more players. Thank you, Christine. Uh, are there any other questions from, from the audience? I, I would like to, uh, to, to put one, uh, one question. Um, Considering, uh, as you mentioned, the enormous amount of uh, GNSS uh, uh, receivers that are now uh, all around the world, uh, how, how do you see the improvement in knowledge of Earth dynamics uh, in different aspects, as you, you mentioned, uh, comparing to other techniques, for example, for the water uh, monitoring, um, and also uh, vegetation cover. Uh, do you see this as a complement of um, other remote sensing techniques um, or it can compete in quality uh, with these other uh, techniques? How do you see this? Um, I don't think it can stand on its own. It's a complementary. I think it's a complementary measurement. It has better temporal sampling than the satellites. <laughs> The satellites always will give you a better spatial, I think always give you a better spatial representation. They do different things. So for vegetation, most people use NDVI, normalized difference vegetation index, but it doesn't measure water content. And for a lot of that, people would say, oh, well, we can just use a radar. And I'm like, well, go ahead, show you can do that everywhere. And you can't do anything everywhere. Um, one of the real positives of what I did was that the data were free. But it's also because in the Western US, we have a lot of empty space where people can put instruments and you're measuring something environmental scientists care about. You can't do the same if your GPS receivers are in busy cities. You know, you just, if you put your GPS receivers on top of a roof, you're not gonna get anything of any interest. So the people that uh, we have installed, literally 20,000 GPS receivers around the world with fairly open data policies, but you can't use them all. So you will always want satellites that to complement them. Um, it, it's also a question of whether you want in situ data. And you really can't trust your satellite measurements unless you have in situ data to validate. So I, I think it's a marriage of convenience of sorts. They don't, they complement each other would be the answer, I think. I, I think, though, to make these measurements more widely available, you do need open source code so people can look at the, the data. So that's one of the things I've worked on more recently. You mentioned uh, open source uh, 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 and uh, also uh, open source uh, software and um, uh, not only the access to the data, but also the, the software to process it. And I know that you have a, a project uh, related with the uh, processing of uh, reflected signals. Can you uh, refer, refer to that briefly? Um, so, uh, so for the Western US, um, we, uh, we had, we measured uh, climate signals for about a decade. I don't know the rules in Europe, but it, the rule in the US is if you demonstrate your technique works, 
usually with National Science Foundation funding, they take the funding away. So, you know, the problem is always that once you show something works, then it's up to other federal agencies to actually apply that technique uh, in the future. So for example, Professor Tapley, I'm sure he would agree that NOAA is heavily involved in satellite altimetry now because it's a demonstrated technique and it's operational. So the same would be true for reflections. I no longer uh, analyze data for people uh, on a continuous basis. Um, instead, I'm trying to make open source code so that they can do it if they want to. Uh, and, and the two places I'm trying to make the biggest contribution are for the cryosphere, where there's a real lack of in situ data at the poles, and also for sea level. It seems like sea level is a place where we really do need more tide gauges in an absolute reference frame. And I feel like my code can make a better contribution. Uh, if you speak Python, <laughs> you can install my code by saying pip install GNSS REFL. But you know, if you don't speak Python, uh, you can uh, follow my, uh, go to my websites. The top one is listed there. There's some information there about how to get access to the code. Or you can follow me on Twitter. I actually joined Twitter in part to reach people that are under the age of 40. So I, I don't kid myself that anyone my age pays any attention. But you can sometimes uh, get people to use your codes if you make it easier to use. And that's been my goal. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Christine. This was uh, really uh, interesting. Um, just a few minutes. Uh, if somebody uh, else. Uh, has, uh, yeah, I had one question. Uh, yes, if I, asked her if I could. Christine, uh, I was intrigued not only with the last comments you made, but also about what the areas you're working in, but also it just occurs to me going into it. Is there any way or anyone thinking about trying to get the GPS measurements down to some sort of continental base in the Antarctic? There's so much uh, need for both the motion and the uh, rebound in that area there, but it looks like it's a very difficult thing to go to actually get those measurements. Is that something that anyone's paying any attention to? The, you mean so GPS measurements down in Antarctica or? Yeah, bedrock? the GPS measurements, not just to the surface snowfall, but getting down to the bedrock or the continental or the places where the. Um, the, the ones on the coast are definitely in uh, bedrock, but you're right. The ones on the ice sheet, no, they're not. I have done reflectometry on the ice sheets, but again, you're right. They're not, they're not on rock. Um, I think that, that they had that big initiative, uh, GNET and ANET. I think they had some sites, uh, it was called the Polar Year, International Polar Year or something like that. And they did do that. There are GPS, net, a GPS network was installed there, but my understanding was the funding went away. You know, it was kind of thing where they put up the network for five years, but uh, you were supposed to get the answer in five years, so. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very hostile. I, so I don't know, Byron. I mean, I, I think people for sure uh, look at that. Mostly they're interested in figuring out what mantle viscosity is and elastic parameters are down there. Um, but yeah, of course, you're right. It does. It influences the snow accumulation as well. So. I'll go check that version. Thank you. <laughs> it's a great presentation, by the way. Oh, thank you. I picked my background so well, and I can't get you guys to see it. I feel bad. <laughs> oh, well. Any other questions? Mm, not. OK, no, no okay. other question, uh, Christine. Let okay. me thank you again for All right. Thank you very invitation. much. I'll say hi to my, I'll say hi to George for you, Byron. Thank you. Appreciate it, Christine. Okay. I'm going to say stop share and then I'm going to say leave. Okay. Bye bye. Yes, I will wrap up. No. Okay. Okay. So 
I will uh, just uh, try to wrap up this uh, session. Uh, first, I uh, want to uh, thank you again to the, the presenters uh, for sharing uh, their work in this excellent set of uh, uh, presentation, which uh, tackle different aspects of the use of uh, space technologies. To wrap up, I would like to, to stress a common trace uh, in these uh, different uh, perspectives uh, that were uh, presented to us, is uh, that is the precise quantification and uh, monitoring uh, Earth and space activities towards uh, a full comprehension of the underlying dynamics, uh, which is the basis to establish the, <coughs> sorry, uh, to, to, to establish the, the and, and the, 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 the basis for, for understanding, sorry, the, the, uh, the dynamics and to anticipate and mitigate uh, climate change effects and establish rules for earth and space exploration and exploitation, which is well in line with the scope of uh, the space earth interactions, interactions area of the UT Austin uh, Portugal program, as uh, Patrick uh, mentioned uh, before. <clears throat> the presentation addressed all topics uh, that are of increasing interest uh, for our society. Uh, for example, the first presentation uh, addressed the uh, problems which are also raising increased interest uh, in, in Portugal where some companies are now involved in a recent ESA project uh, called Clear Space One, uh, which is related to space debris. Uh, furthermore, the exploitation of miniaturized platforms, uh, small satellites, that together with new developments in MEM sensor, like accelerometers, uh, and maybe uh, the development in cold atom technologies in, in this uh, scope, uh, developments in communications, uh, logging and computing capacities, as well as the global positioning systems, not only GPS, but also uh, uh, developments, for example, in uh, Galileo, which is now coming, reaching the, this is full operational capacity, as well as uh, Beidou and Glonus, and the, the development of new, new ways uh, for the exploitation of available signals, uh, like uh, Christina uh, mentioned, uh, the reflectometry uh, area, for example, uh, and also uh, the Sentinel uh, missions uh, from ESA, where the signals are also can also be exploited uh, in in uh, different ways, not only for altimetry are also opening new prospects for a continuous earth and space uh, monitoring uh, capabilities. This uh, is uh, in line with uh, also with, with projects that are now starting <clears throat> the scope uh, of the UT Austin uh, Portugal program, as uh, uh, Professor Taplay mentioned, which aim to further exploit uh, small satellite technologies and, uh, and sensors. Um, in short, uh, I would say that we are entering a, a new uh, decade in uh, space, uh, uh, in the expo exploration of uh, space uh, uh, technologies, uh, where new opportunities and, and challenges are uh, there and uh, leveraged by new observation techniques, which demand a deeper understanding of the dynamics of our environment uh, as our uh, capability to measure small changes uh, is, is growing. So uh, I think these three presentations uh, gave uh, a nice uh, overview of the state of, of the art, let's say, uh, in the, these uh, aspects uh, of um, in, space uses, uh, not only for Earth observation, but also for space uh, monitoring space activities, which is, uh, of course, a very uh, important uh, aspect uh, uh, today. So with this, uh, I would like to thank you again to uh, attendees and all the presenters. And uh, I give the word back to Patrick. Uh, and so I say goodbye to, to you. Thank you very much. 
Yeah, and I can only um, add my thank you to all the wonderful presentation by all the speakers and um, <clears throat> to yeah to my colleagues over in Portugal for organizing uh, this flawless uh, online masterclass. I hope uh, everyone enjoyed it and benefited as much as I could. I believe this is going to be recorded and so um, it might also be available for offline use later. And uh, with that, yeah, I add my <clears throat> Um, bye bye to everyone. Um, good to um, talk to everyone, and um, we'll see you sometime, hopefully in person in the future somewhere. <laughs> bye bye. Bye, Patrick. Bye, Elise. Bye, thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. So I will give it over. I will hand the, the, the wrapping up and recording stopping to the masterclass organizer to the main. Okay. 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 Bye, bye, Lisa. Very nice. good to see you. Perfect. Nice to see you. <laughs>